You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. fast are we going? Oh, 60, 65. Steady as she goes. Are you sure the speedometer's working? I think so. Why? It's just that those hills over there, they haven't moved all morning. Um, hills don't move. You know that, honey. But we've been driving for hours. Shouldn't we be a little bit closer? This is the wide open spaces. Objects are not closer than they appear. I can say that again. What you have here, ma'am, is the great American Southwest. Desert to the right of us, desert to the left. Amber waves of cactus and all that. Where are we, anyway? Well, if it's Tuesday, this must be New Mexico. Where's the map? I got it. Mm, you're wrong. Me? I'm never wrong. First time for everything. Actually, it's Arizona. You're kidding. Nope. Nope? Yep. Could have fooled me. There should be a town pretty soon. I'll watch the signs. You need a rest stop? Oh, it might be nice to stretch our legs. Get some lunch, don't you think? I think that's a capital idea, Mrs. Carter. Mm, say that again. What? Mrs. Carter. I like the way it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. How long has it been? Let me see, 238 hours and 17 minutes. Wow, you're good. You're right, I am, don't forget it. <laughs> Not much chance of that. You want a soda? There should be some in the back. All gone, I already checked. Then we better hope for a town. We could use some gas, too. Don, look out. What does he want? Gosh, I don't know, to go around this? Well, let him. Don't worry. I'm not going to duel with him. Look at that. His license plate. Three sevens. Don, listen. What's wrong with the car? I don't know. We still got a quarter tank. I... Oh. Oh, great. There will be a tow truck any time now. You'll see. How do you know? Three sevens. You don't really believe that. Watch. Hi there, folks. Need a tow? As a matter of fact, we do. Well, come on then. Hop in the front seat. Gas station's about 20 miles. They got a mechanic? Oh, sure do. Fix it right up. What did I tell you? Huh? Let's go, honey. You are so lucky, Dawn. <laughs> Luck had nothing to do with it. Don and Pat Carter, honeymooning couple on their way back to New York. They've had the time of their lives, and they'll be home in a few days. Or that was the plan. But their new life together is full of surprises. Very shortly, Mr. and Mrs. Carter will be subjected to a gift of sorts, one that most humans never receive in a lifetime. They will be given a glimpse into the future. The price of that glimpse? A mere penny, one hundredth of a dollar. The time is now. The place of their revelation is a little diner in Ridgeville, Arizona. But what our honeymooners don't realize yet is that this unassuming town just happens to lie on the outskirts of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Nick of Time, starring Marshall Allman and Jamie Brown, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Yeah. 
how long is he gonna take? Relax, honey. He just put it up on the rack. How can I relax in this heat? You could fry an egg on the sidewalk. Well, that's not a bad idea. I'm getting pretty hungry. I'd settle for a cold drink. There's a water fountain at the side of the station. Fine. I hope it works. Go ahead. I'll talk to him and see what's going on. You do that. Don, all I want to do is go home. Me too, baby. There's a lot of miles between here and Manhattan. And you have to be back at work next week, remember? How could I forget? There's a promotion hanging on the balance. Look, I'll see what's up. Then we'll have some lunch. Okay? Okay. I don't mean to complain. Good luck. Hang in there a little while longer. We'll make it. I know we will. I'm just impatient to get on with our life. Me too. Oh, hi, Mr. Carter. Hi there. How's it coming? Well, she's coming. You got yourself a bad fuel pump is all. That right. Well, can you fix it? Sure. I can fix it. Be a while, though. Oh. Why is that? Won't take but an hour to put it on. But I gotta order one from Klingman. How long's that gonna take? Well, if I send the truck over now, hour, hour and a quarter each way. Oh. You know, my wife would like to get going as soon as possible. I'll bet she would. Can't keep every part in stock, though. Don't see cars like this all the time. Can you get right on it? I'd appreciate it. We can't wait around all day. Oh, I'll get it done for long. Don't worry. Why don't you and the missus take it easy? Have some chow. Where would you suggest? Diner's right down the street. Best in town. Ask the truckers, they'll tell you. Thanks, I'll, uh... I'll do that. We'll be... we'll be at the diner then. Let us know when you're finished. Sure thing. There you are. How are you holding up? The drinking water isn't cold. I'm sorry, baby. Well? Fuel pump's shot. But it's a new car. That's what he said. He'll get right on it. How long? A couple more hours. What? Maybe three. That's crazy. Four tops. Are you kidding? That's the max he promised. How come? What's the problem? He has to send the truck to the next town for a part. And where is that? I don't know. New Mexico? Colorado? Someplace like that. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Let's take a walk. Ready for some lunch? Lunch? We might as well just move here, put down some roots. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll rent a room at a motel. Get the weekly rate. <laughs> yeah, well, is it air conditioned? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking an electric fan. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna look for a job tomorrow. <laughs> Where? I don't know, but I'm holding out for an executive position. <laughs> well, maybe there's an Indian reservation. We can move into a teepee. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet to you. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Where's Restaurant Row? Just ahead. You can see the diner from here. <laughs> uh, uh, speaking of jobs, you think I should phone the office again? Easy, lover. You're going to lose that promotion if you keep pestering them. I'm probably going to lose it anyways. Oh, that's a fine attitude. I thought I married a man on the way up. Who's the best man for the position? Me. There you are, then. Thompson has seniority. It doesn't mean a thing. Take it from me. Little Mary Sunshine, huh? That's my name. Whoops. What's wrong? Don't step on the cracks in the sidewalk. Why? Or I'll break my mother's back. I'm only trying to save her life. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Here we are. The best coffee shop in town. The only coffee shop in town. Well, looks like we got the place to ourselves. Except for that man at the counter. Yeah, nice Stetson. Think I should get one? I'll be right with you, folks. Oh, not at the counter, please. Is the booth all right? Anywhere you like. I wonder what specials they got. I just want something cold to drink. Well, they have ice, don't they? Knock wood. <laughs> well, look at that. Huh. 
Well, wonders never cease. Look at what? The napkin holder. Mm, what about it? It's got one of those little built-in vending machines. The Mystic Seer. Answers. Read what it says. Insert one cent. Ask me a yes or no question. You put a penny in and push the lever down. Mm, lovely. The plastic devil's head's a nice touch. I'll bet it even wobbles when the coin goes in. I'll bet it does. May I see a menu, please? The mystic seer knows all. Does he, she love me? Will I become rich? Is my future bright? I can answer those questions for free. Well, let's find out what the mystic seer says. You're like a little boy. Come on. It'll be fun. I got a penny somewhere. Here's a question. Anything exciting ever happen around here? How exciting. Like those little pieces of paper you get in fortune cookies. Things are not as they seem. Now that's interesting. Is it? Menu, darling. Oh, right. There you go. Oops. What's the matter? I knocked over the salt shaker. Well, I better throw some over my shoulder. Don, Don, really. There, that's better. Just to be on the safe side. Soup of the day, fresh garden salad. I wonder how fresh. Honey. Hmm. <laughs> you think I should phone the office in New York? Do you? Uh, I guess not. Uh, bread and chicken fried steak with country gravy. Doesn't that sound yummy? Very low cal. Howdy. Howdy. Some water for you folks, or are you made up your minds yet? I'll have a lettuce and tomato sandwich on whole wheat, iced tea with lots of ice. You, sir? I'll have the same. Coming right up. How's the water? Ugh, yuck. He must have siphoned it out of a mud hole. Not that good, huh? <laughs> Hold on. What are you doing? Getting some more pennies. Look at you. A rabbit's foot, a plastic four-leaf clover. You really are superstitious, aren't you? Isn't everybody? Well, to a degree. What are you going to ask now? What else? Am I going to be promoted for Pete's sake? Ha! What does it say? It has been decided in your favor. See? Your worries are over. <laughs> I think I'll phone, though. Honey. I, I was I was going to call anyways, wasn't I? There, there's a phone by the restroom. I'll be right back. Well, you better be. Here you go. Thanks. You need any ketchup? Mm, this will be fine. Well, if you want anything, you just let me know. Thank you. I started already. I hope you don't mind. Not in the least. What are you so happy about? <clears throat> you are now looking at the youngest office manager in the history of the company. <gasps> I'm so proud of you. I told you, didn't I? So did he. Who? The mystic seer. Well, I told you first. You sure did. How's this sandwich? Passable. Office manager. Oh, that's amazing. We should ask him something else. He really came through on that one. And while you're at it, ask him why he didn't warn us. About what? That the whole wheat bread is stale. <laughs> Let's see. Does he, she love me? Don't you know? Will I become rich? Wait, I know that too. I'm going to be the first millionaire accountant in the company. Office manager, dear. All right, Mystic Seer. 
Is it really gonna be four hours before we get out of here? That's my question. You may never know. What does that mean? Who knows? He does. Look at that winking eye. Devilish creature. I gotta know more. Well, it'll cost you another penny. So, I'm an office manager now. What do you mean we may never know? Wait, wait. It's not a yes or no question. Um... You mean something could keep us from knowing? Something could happen to us? If you move soon. Now what's he getting at? He's a mystic. What do you expect? G give me another penny. I'm all out. Well, I can see I'm going to have to be the frugal one in the family. It's just one. All right. Thanks. You mean we're not, we're not supposed to move? We're supposed to stay here? Only one question per penny, please. That makes a good deal of sense. Well, I'm not staying unless I get some dessert. One more. One more. Give me another penny. You're gonna break me. Try again? Here. That's all I have. Okay, machine. Should we stay here till three o'clock then? Look at this slip. There is no question about it. Let's go for a walk. Funny. Every answer seems to fit. You're joking, aren't you? I mean, Dawn, no, no more. Okay, if we don't stay here until three o'clock, will something bad happen to us? Honey, for heaven's sake. Read it. Let, all right, let me see that. Go ahead. This is silly. I don't... What does it say? Do you dare risk finding out? That's... That's what it says. Do you realize what it means? Do you dare risk finding out? It doesn't mean anything. Can we go now? No, it's not three o'clock yet. I asked if we don't wait until three, will something bad happen? And it said... That's exactly right. It. You're talking about a machine, Dawn. We're not talking okay, about... Okay, okay, let's... Let's, or let's order some ice cream. Are you stalling? No, no. Of course not. But you said you wanted dessert, didn't you? Look, I think you're taking this a little too seriously. Taking what seriously? It's, it's, it's something to pass the time. Besides, it's, it's hot out there, isn't it? I suppose some ice cream would taste good. Over here! Ready for your check? Uh, not yet. Two dishes of your best ice cream, please. One vanilla, one chocolate. Yes, sir. Now, we'll sit here and enjoy a cool dessert. Then we'll both feel better. Do you agree? If that's what you really want. Hmm. That was good. Yeah, it was. Uh, now can we go? Are you sure you don't want anything else? I'm sure. Of oh, some more iced tea? Don, please, let's go. Okay. Yes. I... I suppose we should. It's 2.45 already. Do you have enough cash? Of course. I'll go pay. Just leave it. If you don't mind, I'd like to get out of here. We've done enough sitting lately. No problem. Uh... Well, I guess that's it, then. That's it.
The money's on the table with the check. Well, thank you kindly. Now you come on back now. Whew, still hot. Yeah. Hotter than ever. Maybe it won't take them four hours to fix the car, you think? Uh, maybe. Don. What? Tell me one thing. Yeah? You didn't really want to stay in there till three o'clock, did you? No. Honey? No. But... But what? Why was it so specific? Specific? You saw the answers. If you move soon, that makes a good deal of sense. Try again. You've memorized them? There's no question about it. You may never know. Do you dare risk? Dawn. What? It's a novelty machine. A napkin holder in a cafe in Ridgeville, Arizona. Not something... Dude, don't you think I know that? Well, I'm glad you do. Because for a while there, you were what, freaking me out. What about my promotion? Then, huh? Didn't it tell me it has been decided in your favor? Dawn. Listen to yourself. Oh, oh. Oh, forget it. Don't say it. Superstitious. Well? It's like you married an alcoholic, isn't it? Only instead of bottles hidden around the house, it's rabbit feet and four-leaf clovers in my pocket, in the car, all over the place. And you're all mine. I wouldn't have it any other way, honey. Truly? Have I ever lied to you? No. Let's walk over to that garage and see how the car's coming. Maybe he took some pity on us and got the fuel pump finished ahead of time. Wouldn't that be nice? You're always looking on the bright side of things, aren't you? That's me. What are you doing? I'm not, I'm not doing anything. You keep looking around as if you're expecting something to happen. Do I? You are worried, aren't you? I wouldn't say that. Oh, honey. You make me wonder when you act like this. Like how? The little things I can take, you know, the lucky charms, not walking under ladders. There's a good reason for that one, okay? Something might drop on your head, a can of paint or... But this, it's too much. I'm sorry. I'm sorry too, Don. We're having such a wonderful trip, so don't spoil it. With I all... said I was sorry, okay? I'm not trying, I'm not trying to upset you. Well, I know you're not. Let's just forget it. Green light. What? Time to cross the street. We're almost there. Oh. I wonder what people do here. I don't see one movie theater. You know, maybe they go to the next town. What's it called? Uh, Willimon or uh, Klingman or... Don? Are you listening to me? What? Yeah, I heard what you said. That doesn't change the facts, though. What facts? Six straight answers telling us to oh, not honey, leave me. Don't. Please, let it go, okay? Will you stop treating me like a child? I didn't make those Dawn! answers. Don! That car! Get out of the way! Don, look out! Oh my god, he didn't even pay any attention to the light. He just kept coming like we weren't even there. I don't even know. You're all right now. It's over. It's over. What time is it? What? The time. Look at the time. It's exactly three o'clock. Really, Dawn, I'm all right. No, you're not. That was quite a moment. Amen. If you hadn't pulled me out of the way, you'd have one squashed honeymooner on your hands. You should sit down. Honestly, I'm fine. We both should. Where are we going? In here. Not the diner. Just for a moment. Don. Well, why not? Well, there must be someplace else to sit down. Well, I don't see one. Do you? I know what you're thinking. All right? I admit it was a strange coincidence, but I... So? If it was a coincidence, then why, why are you worried about going back inside? I'm not. I just want to... You have to admit. It was a pretty far-fetched coincidence. Maybe. Then we'll sit for a minute. Have some more iced tea.
Well, hi, you two. Back already? Yeah. It's pretty hot out there. Yeah, sure is. I'll be right with you. Thanks. Oh, no. They're sitting in our booth in front of our mystic seer. Yes, they are. Well, we'll just have to try another one. How about that booth? Or the next one, they have machines too. I'm sure they, uh... Honey. What? Look at me. Do you honestly believe that gizmo over there can foretell the future? It foretold ours. How? Sit anywhere you like, folks. Thank you. Sit down, honey. Yes. All right, what'll it be? Uh, just some iced tea. Honey? I don't care. Make that too. Be right back. I asked you a question. It's a reasonable one. How? You want to know how? I don't know. But when that car almost hit us, it was three o'clock. That's exactly when the fortune... Dawn, you said three o'clock, not that machine. You decided to sit here until 2.45. You what, are the what, one... what did I do? What did I do? Oh, this is ridiculous. Ridiculous. What are you so upset about? You can't even consider the possibility that... Here you go. Great. Anything else for now? No. Wait, yes. Can you bring me some more change? What kind? Uh, a quarter's worth of pennies. Make it two quarters if you can spare it. Well, I can give you a roll. That would be great. Sure, just a minute. Dawn, what are you doing? What any logical mind would do. Before we do anything else, I'm going to get the answers we need, and I'm going to get them now. Logical. How can you call this logical? Could you keep your voice down? If you can't see that you made up all the details yourself and all that that thing gave you back was generalities, then I don't know what honey, to do. Honey, would you listen to me? Will you listen? Go ahead. I have nothing more to say. I'm not going to argue with you. Sure, I filled in the details. What does that prove? Could the machine make them up? All it has inside are answer slips that are already printed. Then we agree. What are you... Let me finish. You heard me talk a hundred times about mathematical probability, right? It's my job. It's what I work with. I know that. There are probably thousands of these machines in diners all over the country. There are at least ten of them in here alone. And every one of these thousands of machines are hundreds of little answer slips arranged in some kind of order. Probably a different order for every machine, right? So? So, it's mathematically possible that the way the slips are arranged in just that one machine at this particular time might apply to our future. How can you say that? Ice tea for two. Right. And your pennies. You know, too bad that thing's not a slot machine. <laughs> Isn't it, though? All right, you need anything else, just wave. I'm here all day. Got it. I'd appreciate it, honey, if you wouldn't act as if I were losing my mind. Well, aren't you? Is that what you think? Let me try to explain. You don't have to explain anything. But I do. Try to follow what I'm saying. There is a higher realm of mathematics that goes beyond probabilities. Some of it comes from quantum physics. Why are you telling me this? Hear me out, please. Young, the psychologist, talked about synchronicity, meaningful coincidence. The point being that there are no pure coincidences. Everything is interconnected. If we can just spot the connections, it's what the Chinese I Ching is based on. The one where you throw three coins and look up your fortune in a book. Dawn, please. It's not fortune telling. It only seems to be. The idea is there are 64 hexagrams. Each one represents a pattern that 
that reflects our place in the world at a given moment. Find the right one, and all else follows. It couldn't happen any other way. But the coins could come up in any combination. No, that's just it. Given everything else, at a particular point in time, there is only one pattern that fits. The Qing is just a means of identifying that pattern. So, you do believe in fortune telling? You're not listening. I said... How can you let yourself be controlled by such a thing? Can't you see what you're doing to yourself? What am I doing? What about the questions you asked? Were they mathematically determined too? I don't know. All I know is that the answers matched them. They would have matched any questions you asked. Does he love me? You may never know. Will I become rich? If you move soon. Is my future bright? There is no question about it. Ask anything, okay? It will always seem to fit. Honey, that's not the point. What is the point? We're about to find out. They're leaving. We can have our old booth back. Oh, Don. Bring your glass. Now we can test the hypothesis. <laughs> Here we go, here we go. First question. Did you know about that car almost hitting us? What do you think? Oh, that's conclusive. Will we reach New York City all right now? The chances are good. You see that? Hmm, very precise. Well, what do you expect? Okay, a slip of paper should come out that says, Hi, you Dauncey and Patsy. So how's by you? I never said these slips were made for us personally. I only said... I heard. Honey, don't you see that you could get the same kind of answers from any one of those machines in here? Try. You'll see. The same kind, maybe, but not the same answers. So you're not interested in being objective? I'm... I'm interested in what's gonna happen to us. Okay, machine. Is it still going to take four hours to fix the car? It has already been taken care of. Swell, that's it then, let's go. Wait, wait! Maybe, maybe it doesn't mean- Mean what? Mr. Carter? Yes. Oh, hi. From the garage. I thought you'd like to know your car's ready. Is it? Had a lucky break. Found a fuel pump right here in town. Last one they had, too. That's... That's good news. We'll be right over. Okie dokie. Shall we? You think that was a coincidence? Yes. Why don't you ask it some questions, then? Or are you afraid to? All right, if that's what it takes. Okay, go ahead. Here's a penny. Will we reach El Paso by tomorrow? We're not going through. Quiet. You're trying to trick it. If that's what you really want. See? It can't be tricked. Will I ever get married? Read it. The answer to that is obvious. Mystic Seer. It isn't possible to foresee the future, is it? What does it say? That's up to you to find out. You're a stupid piece of junk, aren't you? It all depends on your point of view. I don't want to stay here. Even if it's true? Sit down. Especially if it's true! What are you talking about? I've had enough! We're not finished with the test. Maybe you're not, but I am. I think you are afraid of it. Not of it, Don. Of what then? Don't you know? Can't you see it on my face? Fine, then I'll finish it for you. Okay, machine. Are we always going to live in New York? Are we always going to live in Los Angeles, then? Well, then are we going to live in the Midwest? Then are we going to live in this country? Dawn. Dawn! No more. What? Let's 
go. No! Put those down. Are we just going to stay here? I don't know! Sweetheart, listen, please. If you love me, listen to me. No, you listen to me! I believe that this machine can tell what's going to happen to us. I believe it, Pat, based on empirical evidence. Do you think I'm just gonna leave it behind? We can't afford to do that. There's too much at stake, but you won't even admit it's possible. All right, it's possible. Is that what you wanna hear? I'm not talking about that anymore. I'm talking about you. Us, Pat, us. I know, but are you just gonna sit here and let this machine run your life? Run my life? Well, isn't that what you're letting it do? Don, it made you phone the office before. It made you stay here instead of leave. It made you afraid to walk down the street. Now it's telling you where you're going to live. That's not true. Honey, it's as if, as if every superstitious feeling that you've ever had is all wrapped up in this one machine. It isn't just a matter of whether it can foretell the future. It's a matter of whether you believe more in these predictions than you do in yourself. Honey, you can decide your own life. You have a good mind, a fine mind. Don't waste it trying to justify a penny fortune machine to yourself, okay? We have such a wonderful life ahead of us, but only if we depend on ourselves to make it wonderful. Not if we, you know? Oh, Pat. Shh, come on. I don't want to be told what's going to happen to us. I want us to make it happen. Together. All right, baby. Don't cry. Something wrong, folks? No, no. We're OK. It's all right, baby. We'll go now. We'll go. I'm a jerk. You're not. You're wonderful. Sure I am. Come on. I'm the world's biggest jerk. <laughs> you want my handkerchief? Come on. We'll go get the car, all right? Don't do it just for me, Don. Honey, that's the best reason I have right now. Just... Just give me time, huh? I'll shape up. I love you so much. I love you too. There it is. No one's using it. Thank God. Sit anywhere you like, folks. Now, it's you two. Can we sit here, please? As soon as I clean up. We don't care. Has to be this one. All right, suit yourself. Just water again? It doesn't matter. Do you have any more pennies? I think so, yes. Then go ahead. Can we... ask some more questions now? What does it say? Choice is yours. Do you think we might... leave Ridgeville today? Let me see. Oh. Well, where are we going to get some money to live on? Should I... Sh should I sell our car? What? Then... A delicate balance in the little town of Ridgeville, Arizona. Two people who have escaped from the tyranny of fear and superstition. Two others permanently enslaved by it. One couple able to face the future with confidence. Another couple facing it with hopeless dread. Victims of life imprisonment. In the darker regions of the Twilight Zone.
Please like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. Nick of Time, starring Marshall Allman and Jamie Brown with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Paul Cook, Craig Brawley, Amber Lake, Jeff Lupiton, Kate Johnson, Doug James, and Elizabeth Lido. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Get your umbrellas and your booties if you're going out. Possible thunderstorms over Margaret? the next few hours. Cloudy tomorrow with a 50% chance Margaret? Of yes, Miss Alva? Come here, please. I'll be right there. Now, it's important. The dishes are all done. Do you need something? It's getting late. It's not that late, is it? We can play a game of cards if you like. A storm is coming. Is it? Well, that's what they said on the radio. A very serious one. Hmm. <laughs> the sky was clear this afternoon. Nevertheless, I think you should be getting home. Well, I'll just fix your cup of tea then. I'd like to be in my bed. So early? Well, I'm feeling a bit tired. Well, as you wish. Do you have your shawl? It doesn't do much good. Oh, awfully chilly this evening. I'll raise the thermostat. Ah, there's the rain. Oh, I hope the roof holds. Why wouldn't it? You had it re-shingled last year. Here we go. I'll turn the bed down for you. Now, take my hands up and out of your chair. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I don't know what I'd do without you. Oh, you do just fine. You'll be walking again soon. Have you been doing your exercises like Dr. Mays told you? It's no use. These legs simply don't work anymore. Oh, Margaret, I'll never leave this house again. Now you stop that. There's a big, wide world out there. Places to go and people to see. The only way I'll see them is if they come here. And there's not much chance of that. Most everyone I know has passed on. Surely not. You have a phone right next to the bed. Call some friends. Keep in touch. Oh, it's been too long. I don't know if the numbers work anymore. Of course they do. If they don't, talk to Miss Finch at the telephone exchange. She'll look them up for you. Now, wait right here. I'll get your pills and a nice cup of hot tea. Hurry, Margaret, the rain. You'll never get home. Oh, don't you worry about me, Miss Elva. I'll be back with your tray. Oh, my. Such a terrible, terrible storm. Miss Elva Keene who lives alone on the outskirts of Linden Fleet in Maine. Her world has shrunk to the size of the small house she owns and may never leave again. 
For some years, the pattern of Miss Keene's life has consisted of sitting in her wheelchair or lying in her feather bed, knitting, reading books, listening to the radio, eating modest portions of food, napping, taking her medication, and waiting. For exactly what? She's not sure. Perhaps for something different to happen. Something small but significant that will make all the difference. Miss Keene doesn't know it yet, but her time of waiting has just ended. For something different is about to happen, by way of an unexpected phone call in the middle of a stormy night. A telephone call routed directly through the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Night Call, starring Marriott Hartley with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Oh! Oh! Someone calling? At this hour? Oh. Hello? I I'm sorry I didn't hear. The thunder. H Hello? Hello? Who is on the line, please? Oh, no one, apparently. How odd. Perhaps I was dreamy. Oh, for the love of... Hello? Hello? I can't hear you. If you wish to speak to me, please say something. Or I'll hang up. Hello? 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 Just a moment, Margaret. You're up early this morning. Oh, what is the matter with this phone? You're trying to make a call? No one's picking up at the switchboard. Well, I imagine they're pretty busy this morning, what with the storm and all. I suppose. Phone company, Miss Finch speaking. Ready for your tea? Uh, just a moment. Miss Finch? This is Elva Keene. Yes, Miss Keene. Can I help you? Oh, I, I certainly hope so. Well, I'll do my best. What is the problem? Uh, last night, uh, about 2 a.m., my telephone rang. Oh? I answered it, but no one spoke, and I didn't hear any receiver hanging up. Just silence. Is that right? Or, or rather, a... Uh, a crackling sound, like wind and rain. That would be electrical noise, a faulty line, most likely. The same thing happened a few moments later. Well, I'll tell you, Miss Keene, that storm last night about ruined our service. We've been flooded with complaints about fallen wires and bad connections. I'd say you're pretty lucky that your telephone is working at all. Oh, you would, would you? Yes, ma'am. And would you say, then, that someone was trying to call me, but that the connection was washed out? That's as good an explanation as any, Miss Keene. But who would have tried to call me in the middle of the night? I'm sorry. I wish I could be of more help, but the way things are right now... Uh, is it likely to happen again? I really couldn't say. It might. Were you expecting a call? Not at that hour. It depends on what's causing it to happen, of course. Could you find out? If there's a breakdown somewhere, our crews will find it and repair it. And what am I to do in the meantime? If it does happen again, you just call me and I'll run a special check on it. Will you do that? Well, if that's your only suggestion. 
I'm afraid it is. I'll be here in any event. Well, goodbye, Miss Keene. Goodbye. All taken care of? I'm not sure. I'll start your tea, and then we'll move into the living room. Would you like that? Margaret. Yes, Miss Alva? Did you call me? When? Last night. At two in the morning? No, ma'am, not me. Oh. I thought you might have tried to check on me because of the storm. But then uh, I don't pay you for nights, do I? tea? No, thank you. Have you taken your pill? Yes. Don't I always? Never missed one yet. The highlight of my morning. The mail should be here by now. Shall I check the box? Why don't you do that? With multiple injuries in the five-car pileup, so take caution while driving in these slick conditions. The storms are still very strong in the north and northeast, while the rest of the city the severe storms seem to have passed over. Several areas were still without power last night due to fallen wires. Workmen restored electrical service shortly before dawn. Here's your mail, Miss Alva. Thank you. Anything interesting? Oh, an advertisement. Another advertisement. The light bill, the telephone bill, of course. No personal letters. You heard from your sister a few days ago, didn't you? Oh, that was weeks ago, Margaret. Three weeks and two days, to be exact. Has it been that long? Yes, that long. Nobody cares whether I live or die. Oh, sure they do, Miss Elva. You don't understand. Don't I? You can't. You have no idea what it's like to be alone. But you're not alone. I come by during the day. Yes, you do. And for that, I thank you. But it's been so long since I've had a real visitor. I mean, someone who came of their own accord. Oh, now don't talk like that. You're going to get yourself into a mood. I'm sure lots of people are thinking about you this very moment. Who? You'll hear from someone any time now. Just be patient a while longer. Wouldn't you like to work on your knitting? All right. Can I get you anything else? Not just now. Well, start thinking about what you want to eat tonight. I'll make a list and go to the store later. For now, I better get the dishes washed. Hello? Hello? Margaret? Yes? Come here, quickly. Was that the phone? See, someone's calling you now. Take the receiver. What for? I want you to listen. If you like. Well? There's no one on the line, Miss Elva. Just listen. See if you can hear whether anyone's there. There's nothing. But you heard it ring, didn't you? Yes. Tell me if someone hangs up. Not a thing. The line's dead. Wait. What's the matter? Oh, well, it doesn't matter. I'll call Miss Finch and have them check on it. You really think that's necessary? Yes, I think it's necessary. Am I to suffer calls like that at all hours of the day and night? Calls like what? There was no call. Then why did it ring? It was a mistake, that's all. How could it be a mistake? Someone must have dialed my number. Not if it's a malfunction. Something's wrong with the equipment. I'm sure they'll... What are you doing? Reporting it. Phone company, Miss Finch speaking. Hello, Miss Finch. I thought you should know. I've received another one of those calls.
There we go, I peeled you an apple, and here are two of your favourite cookies to go with your tea. Can you think of anything else? No, no, I'm sure that will do. All comfy? There are perhaps one more pillow. Certainly. Here you are. Thank you, Margaret. You go to so much trouble. It's no trouble at all. I wish you could understand how degrading it is for me to ask for help. I've always been able to take care of myself. Oh, now. We get along just fine, you and me. We're friends. I don't have friends anymore. Don't be silly. You have more friends out there than you realize. Oh, I wish that were true. You'll see. You'll hear from them. And meanwhile, don't fret about those phone calls. Don't give them another thought. I'll try not to. It was the storm, I'm sure of it. Perhaps you're right. Whatever the trouble was, the repairman have fixed it by now. But just to be sure, why don't you keep the receiver off the hook and then you won't be bothered? Oh, that's a good suggestion. You know, I have an extra television set, a portable. I could bring it over if you like. No need. There's hardly any reception out here. There is if you put up an antenna or connect with the cable system. That costs money. Besides, there's nothing I care to see. Suit yourself. But if you change your mind, let me know. You should be getting home. It is getting late. Let's see. You have your pills, your knitting. Would you like a book? Uh, I'll be going right to sleep. Good night then, Miss Keene. See you in the morning. Yes, in the morning. Margaret, there it is again. What should I do? Nothing. Just as I thought. I won't speak. I'll hang it up and then leave it off the hook. Yes? Who's there? Who is it? Hello? What is making this sound? Is anybody there? Anybody at all? Who is on the line? Who is it? Who? Hello? What is that? Please. Please leave me alone. Here we are, your favorite spot in the living room. Not today, please. Well, where then, Miss Elva? Away from the window. If you're going to knit, you'll need the light. I don't care to knit just now. Very well. And close the curtains. Close them? I just opened them. That's the way I want it. But look what a lovely day it is. With the curtains drawn, there'll be hardly enough light for anything. Please do as I say, Margaret. I'm not feeling well. Why? What's wrong? My nerves. I hardly slept last night. You didn't? Not a wink. Why on earth? What happened? Do I have to tell you? No. Not the telephone. Yes. At all hours, over and over again. You're sure? Indeed, I am. The sound is so loud in this house, it hurts my ears. 
Well, we can't have that. And this time, he spoke to me. He didn't. Margaret, I simply can't bear it. Shush, dear, don't you worry. We'll do something about that right now. Call Miss Finch and clear it up. She won't listen. Of course she will. She doesn't take me at all seriously. Well then, I'll have a word with her. We can't have you going without your sleep. Operator? Is that Miss Finch? It is. This is Margaret Phillips, Miss Keene's private nurse. Oh, yes. How are you? I'm fine, but Miss Keene isn't doing so well. Oh, sorry to hear that. Why haven't you fixed her line yet? I've told her we'll repair it as soon as... It's gone beyond that. Now someone is speaking to her. She can't sleep at all. If Miss Keene's health should be disturbed any further, the phone company will be held responsible. Now, just a minute. Give me the phone. Here she is now. She'll tell you herself. Miss Finch. Yes, Miss Keene. There's a voice on the phone. A voice? It says one word over and over. Hello. It doesn't sound normal. It sounds distorted. Are you sure it's a voice? What else could it be? Well, static on the line sometimes. It, it was someone, I tell you. The same someone who kept listening to me say hello over and over again without answering back. The same one who made those horrible noises. What kind of noise? I don't know. That's why I'm calling you. It must stop immediately. A voice, you say? Or was it a man or a woman? I couldn't be sure. So you have no idea? I tell you, there is no way of knowing. It could be either. And you're positive it wasn't someone on your party line? Oh. Don't you think I know the people on my party line? Of course, Miss Keene, of course. Well, I'll have a man come out as soon as possible. The crews are still pretty busy, what with the damaged lines and all from the storm, but I'll tell them to put a rush on it. And what am I to do if this person calls again? Hang up, Miss Keene. But whoever it is will only call back, and then I have to answer to stop the ringing. That's my best advice. It's either that or disconnect the line. No, no, you, you can't do that. What if there were an emergency? I have no way to call out. That's true. Then there isn't much choice. I suggest you talk to them. Try to find out more. Get a name if you can. Do that and we'll have something to go on. We'll take immediate action, I promise you. But I don't wish to speak to them at all. Then I'm afraid there's nothing we can do. So you won't help me? We can't. It could be absolutely anyone. There's no way to know. I see. Then... Good day to you. What did she say? Not a word of help. It's obvious she doesn't believe me. Oh, I'm sure that's not true. As far as she's concerned, I'm just a nervous old biddy falling prey to my imagination. But she didn't actually say... Well, she'll find out differently. You all will, if it's not too late by then. Such talk. You're letting yourself get way too upset. Why don't we have some breakfast? Would you like that? No, I'm not hungry. In a while, then. We'll both have something. I'll leave the curtains drawn so you can catch up on your rest. Would you like a pillow for your back? Make sure they're completely drawn. But it's so dark in here. I can't afford the risk. What do you mean? Well, if someone's out there, he could be watching. Watching what? Me. Oh, nothing tastes right today, not even tea. That's not your fault. I'm feeling so out of sorts. Margaret? Margaret? <clears throat> That's all right. Stay where you are. You're entitled to a nap, too. There. 
That will stop it. I won't put it to my ear. I won't. But if I don't take the call, I'll never know who it is. Oh. All right, I'll leave it on the hook. And the next time it rings, I'll force myself to speak to them and find out what they're up to. Hello? Hello? Who is this? Who's calling, please? Hello. Who's calling? I've had quite enough. Stop this at once. Hello. Why do you keep saying that? Can't you hear me? Please. Hello. Hello. Margaret. Margaret. <clears throat> Margaret. Uh, yes. Oh. Oh, Miss Miss Alva. I was just resting my eyes. Is is everything all right? No, it is not. Mm, then what? The telephone. Oh, D did it ring? I thought I heard something. It's a man. I'm sure of it. How do you know? Because he just called again. I heard the tone of his voice. It was uh, deep and hoarse, like there was something wrong with him. What did he want? I don't know. Then how? He just keeps saying hello over and over. That's all he says. Hello. 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 Now you've got to stop this, Miss Keene. I've got to stop. I'm not the one who... You're working yourself into a state over... Over nothing? I didn't say that. You didn't have to. You were going to say it. Now, Miss Keene, I was not. I think I'd better put you back in your bed so you can... I don't want to be put in my bed. I want to know who this terrible man is who keeps calling. What did Miss Finch tell you? She told you it's probably a bad connection, didn't she? The telephone wires are still wet from the rain. It was not the connection. It's a man. I'm not arguing, Miss Keene, but if he keeps on saying hello... That's all he says. Then obviously he can't hear you. And that would be because of a bad connection. Doesn't that make sense? No. He heard me. I know he heard me. He paused each time and waited for me to speak. I don't know what he wants. Then why don't you hang up on him, Miss Selva? You don't have to listen. Just hang up. Is that so hard to do? No, oh, I've tried that. But the voice. Hello. Over and over. Hello. 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 Then do this. Take it off the hook. There. Now he can't call you, right? The... Nobody can call me. Leave it that way just for the time being, until all this funny business is over. It will be the same on the extension. And then if you decide to make a call, all you have to do is hold down the arm for a second. Isn't that right, Miss Keene? Miss Keene? But why is he calling me? Why would he? Can you tell me that? Why? He wants something from me, but I can't imagine what it is. Oh, I can't bear that sound. Try putting a pillow over it. Uh. No. Hello. Hello. Where are you? What? I want to talk to you. No. Where are you? I want to talk to you. Please. 
Miss Finch, the problem is getting worse. Oh, hello, Miss Keene. I tell you I won't have it. Have you tried leaving it off the hook? No, it doesn't do any good. He just waits for me to hang up so he can call back. I left the receiver off last night, but I can't do it anymore. Even when I bury it under a pillow, the noise keeps me awake. I haven't had any sleep in 24 hours. Then perhaps, Miss Keene, we should disconnect it after all. No. I am an invalid, Miss Finch. I must have telephone service in case of emergency. I'm sure you must. Now, I want the line checked, do you hear? This terrible thing must stop right away. All right, Miss Keene, I'll put a man on it right away, and this time we'll get to the bottom of it. Swear to it. I give you my word. Oh, good, thank you. You don't know what this means to me. I'll call you as soon as we find out the problem. You'll see to it, no matter what it takes. Of course. First thing, we'll give you an answer before noon. Thank you. Don't you worry now. Oh, bless you. That's what we're here for. Your play? What? Pick up your cards, Miss Elva. This is what we need, you'll see. A nice game of canasta. Oh. Yes. Now, it's your play. What is the matter with that girl? Hmm? She promised faithfully that a man would check on it today. The afternoon is almost over and no one's been by. Maybe he doesn't have to come by, Miss Elva. Why wouldn't he? If the problem is somewhere else, with one of the telephone poles, for example. Ah. Uh. Well, I suppose that could be true, but if she promised she'd let me know. Look at your cards. Did you get a good hand this time? Oh. That'll be her, don't you think? Want me to answer it? Oh, yes, yes, if you would. Hello? No, this is Margaret Phillips. Would you like to speak with her? Who is it? Just a moment. You see, it's Miss Finch. Now everything will be fine. Oh, yes? About those calls you say you've been receiving, Miss Keene. Say I've been receiving? Why don't you believe? We sent a man out to trace them. I have his report here. And? He says he followed your line through all its connections. He found the problem. Well, what is it? A fallen wire on the edge of town. Fallen wire? Yes, Miss Keene. The weather blew it free of the pole. I don't understand. One end was on the ground, so no signal at all was getting through. Are you telling me that there were no calls? I'm sorry, but there's no way anyone could have called from that location, Miss Keene. I tell you, a man called me. There must be a phone there. There must be some way for him to call me. Miss Keene. The wire is lying on the ground, unattached. Tomorrow our crew will put it back up and you won't have any further trouble. There must be a way that someone got through. But there is no one out there. No one at all. Out where? Miss Keene, it's the cemetery. <gasps> oh. Miss Keene, are you there? What is it, Miss Elva? Why have you dropped the phone? Will you tell me what's wrong? Miss Keene, for heaven's sake, what is it? Here we are. Valley View Cemetery. Are you sure you want to get out of the car? Yes. I wish you'd tell me why you decided to come all this way. Miss Keene, this isn't good for you. If you hadn't made such a to-do about it, I'd never have taken you in the first place. Why won't you answer? What can there possibly be out here for you to see? 
Get my chair from the back seat, please. Very well, have it your way. Careful, now. Up and out. Here's a blanket for your legs. Though I can't imagine why you'd want to. Miss Elva, what are you looking at? Over there. You mean inside the grounds? On the other side of the gate. All right. I'll have to steer clear of the power lines, though. Well, there's a loose telephone wire hanging down. Can't see where it touches the ground. Where are we going? The first row on the left. About halfway down, as I recall. That's where the wire ends. I knew it. Here? Here. And we better not go any closer. It's fallen directly onto a grave. Right by an old headstone. What's the name? Brian Douglas. And the date of birth and death more than 50 years ago. Oh, the poor young man. Only 27. I knew it. Miss Elva. It's him. Who? It's him. Brian. Oh, Brian. You knew him? Brian, my fiancé. You're... He died a week before we were to be married. Oh, Miss Elva, I didn't know. We were in a car together. I insisted on driving. I was always insisting on things, telling him what I wanted, dominating him in my way. And he always did what I said, always. I lost control of the car, steered it right into a tree. Brian went through the windshield. He was cut to pieces. I was left crippled, and now he's trying to reach me, I'm sure of it. Don't you see? He's trying to reach me. So many years out here alone, in the sun, in the wind, in the rain. And now, at last, I can talk to him. I won't be lonely anymore. Would you like more covers on the bed? No, Margaret, I'm perfectly fine. I can plump up your pillows for you. That's not necessary. I can't leave you like this. I'll be all right. Good night. But... Good night, Margaret. You call me if you need me now. I will. I'll be home all night. Yes, yes, Margaret, good night. Hope you sleep well. Now then, you may call me any time at all. I'm waiting. Oh, this is ridiculous. Now that I want you to call. Brian? Brian? Are you there? Can you hear me? It's Elva. Elva! Oh, Brian. Brian, my dear. Brian, where are you? Where are you, Brian? Can't you hear me at all? Brian? Are you there, Brian? If you are, please speak. It's Elva. Elva, you can speak to me now. I, I, I didn't know it was you, I thought. Brian, please, I know you're there. It's Elva. Talk to me, Brian, please. I beg you. But I didn't. 
didn't mean. I always do what you say. Oh God, but I didn't mean, Brian, I, I didn't mean that. Not this time, I didn't understand. I only meant, oh Brian. Brian, speak to me. No, no, Brian, don't go. Don't leave me here. I, I didn't know it was you. I didn't understand. I tell you, there were so many things I didn't understand. I, I, I didn't mean to say. Brian, please. Please. Oh, please. <laughs> no. Oh. Oh. According to the Bible, God created heaven and earth. But it is every man's prerogative and every woman's to create their own particular and private hell. Case in point, Miss Elba Keen, who in every sense has made her own bed and now must lie in it. Sadder but wiser, by dint of a rather painful lesson in responsibility, transmitted from the Twilight Zone. Please like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Night Call, starring Marriott Hartley with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Sarah Wellington, Meg Thalken, and Doug James. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group and Westwood One. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Greg Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaks. You're traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. That's the signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. How much is this? Shall I wrap it up for you, ma'am? I got all my Christmas shopping done. I need one more present for Uncle Fred. Could you put a big red ribbon on that? Ma, where is he? He'll be here, Tommy. How long? Just a few more minutes. I don't believe it. He's never coming. Excuse me. Yes, madam? Are you the manager? Indeed I am. Mr. Dundee at your service. Well, I have a question for you. Gift wrapping? The customer service counter is downstairs on the first floor. No, no, not there. Oh, a special Christmas item. I'm sure we can find something. What exactly were you... Listen to me, Mr. Dundee. See this sign? What about it? What does it say? Santa will return at 6 o'clock. It's almost 6.30. Oh, yes. Well, you see... And my boy's been waiting all year to see him. We can't stand in line forever. I'll look into it, madam. Perhaps Santa has been detained. You know, so many presents to wrap up at the uh, North Pole. I'm sure the boy understands. You don't know my boy. 
Listen up, Dundee. If the guy in the red suit doesn't show in five minutes, we're going to another department store. Oh, really? That won't be necessary. I want to talk to Santa. How now, son? Where is he? Bartender, pour me another one, will you? Coming right up. Hey, Corwin. Yeah. See the clock on the wall? What about it? You told me to tell you when it was 6.30? Well, it's 6.30. That's exactly what it is. 6.30 on the dot. So what happens now? You turn into a reindeer? Would that that was so. One more, my good man. That's five drinks. No, six. And a sandwich. You owe me, Santa. Relax. I've got your money right here. Say, will you look at that? Where? Those two at the window. Little boy and little girl. Sad faces, don't you think? Yeah, they peek in here, they see Santa getting plastered. Real nice. Go on, show! That's not what's eating them. What is it then? They know there isn't really a Santa Claus. No kidding. Why do you suppose that is? How's that? Don't you ever wonder why there isn't a real one? For kids, I mean. What am I, a philosopher? You know what your trouble is, Corwin? You let that stupid red suit go to your head. Here's your change. I'll flip you for it. Double or nothing. What do you think this is, Atlantic City? Come on, eat your sandwich and get out of here. I've had enough to eat. Where's my drink? I'm coming. Oh, ouch. And keep your fingers out of the till. All right, all right. Can't you take a joke? I catch you doing that one more time, I'm gonna break both your arms up to your shoulder blades. Now go on, get out of here. What's going on? Nothing, just Santa trying to hoist the joint. What's that for? Your tip, my good man. Take it easy now. Oh, snow's pretty slippery. Oh! <laughs> uh, I better sit down for a minute. Mr. Santa, huh? I want a baby carriage and a dolly and a playhouse and a job for my daddy. What? And I want a gun and a, and a set of play soldiers and, and a big turkey for Christmas dinner. You don't think... Oh, you poor kids. Don't you get it? I, I can't help you. I, I can't... I can't even... That's okay. We can wait. We always wait for Santa Claus. This is Mr. Henry Corwin, normally unemployed, who once a year takes the lead role in a uniquely American institution, that of the department store Santa Claus, in a road company version of The Night Before Christmas. But in just a moment, Mr. Henry Corwin, ersatz Santa Claus, will enter a strange kind of North Pole, which is one part the wondrous spirit of Christmas and one part the magic that can only be found in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Night of the Meek, starring Chris McDonald with Stacy Keach as your narrator. When is he? This is so inconsiderate. Here he comes, finally. Will you look at that? Why, he can hardly stand up. Oh, it's disgraceful. There you are. Hello, boys and girls. Ho, ho, ho. Corwin, you're an hour late. I am? One hour and nine minutes, to be exact. Can you beat that? Now, I advise you to get up on your throne without further ado. I'm going. I'm going. And refrain from disillusioning these children any further. All right. All right. I'm going. By showing them that not only isn't there a Santa Claus, but the one in this store happens to be a wino who'd be more at home playing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I take your point, Mr. Dundee. Stand aside. St. Nick is back on the job. Go ahead, climb up on his lap. He won't hurt you, will you, Santa? You won't hurt my little boy. Go on, you tell him. <laughs> What's your name, lad? Percival. You're putting me on. 
Percival Smithers. The third. My dad's name was Percival Smithers. My grandfather's name was Percival Smithers. Oh, I get it. Well, I guess that's not your fault. So, what would you like for Christmas, uh, young Percival? A new front name. <laughs> That's a good one. A real good one. I gotta remember it. Hey, Ma? Yes, dear? I smell something funny. You do? Yeah. And I know what it is, too. The same as Dad. Santa Claus is loaded. Leave my boy alone. Lady, I never laid a glove on a kid. Oh, you've got some nerve drinking on the job. Madam, I am morally ashamed. Oh, you should be. Come along, Percival. I hope this won't scar you for life. Is there some trouble here? Trouble? No, there's no trouble, except that this is the last time I trade in this store. It seems you hire your Santa Clauses out of a gutter. Hey, who are you referring to? Drunken sot. Come on, Percival. Some Santa Claus? You don't even look like him. Mr. Dunning, that lady has got a problem. All right, everyone back to work. Back to your positions. And you... As for you, Mr. Kris Kringle of the Lower Depths, since we are only a few hours from closing, it is my distinct pleasure to inform you that there is no further need for your questionable services. You've had it. Now get out of here. It'll be my pleasure. Pick up your pay downstairs. Oh, and one more piece of advice. I'm all ears. Get that moth-eaten red suit back to where you rented it before you really tie one on and destroy it for good and all, you drunk. Thank you ever so much, Mr. Dundee. As to my drinking, it is in... indefensible. You have my abject apologies. Don't waste your breath. That just doesn't cut it with me anymore. But I have feelings, you know? Plain old human feelings, same as anybody. And I find of late that I have very little choice in the matter of how I express my emotions. I can either drink, or I can... Weep. And drinking is so much more subtle. Will you please leave? But as to my alleged insubordination, I assure you I was not rude to that woman. Someone should remind her that Christmas isn't just barging up and down department store aisles and pushing people out of the way. Or when I'm warning you. Someone should tell her that Christmas is something quite different from that. It's richer and finer and truer and... And it should come with patience, and love, and charity, compassion. That's what I would have told her, had she given me the chance. My, how philosophical, Mr. Corwin. Perhaps, as your parting words, you can tell us how we go about living up to those grand Yule standards which you have so graciously laid out for us. I don't know how. I wouldn't know how to explain it, especially to you. All I know is that I am an aging, purposeless relic of another time and place. A different way of life. And now, I, I don't know how it happened, but... One day I woke up and found myself living in a dirty rooming house on a street that's filled with hungry kids and shabby, scared people. Good people. Where the only thing to come down the chimney on Christmas Eve or any other day of the year is more poverty. Keep your voice down. And if you must know, another reason I drink is so that when I walk up and down the tenements, I can think to myself just for a little while that they really are the North Pole and the children are elves and I'm really Santa Claus, bringing a bag of beautiful things for all of them. Every last one. That's enough out of you. I wish, Mr. Dundee, on just one Christmas, only one, that I could see some of the hopeless ones, the, the dreamless ones. On just one Christmas, I'd like to see the meek really inherit the earth. So that's why I drink, Mr. Dundee, and that's why I weep. Who is that guy? Never heard anyone talk to Mr. Dundee like that. Never heard anybody talk like that.
What the heck is that? Sleigh bells? Yeah, sure it is. Better get home and sober up. Could have sworn I heard. Who's there? In the alley. Stop hiding behind those garbage cans. What are you afraid of? Come out so I can see you. Give oh, a start there, kitty. I gotta get sober. Look at the mess you've made. All right, I'll clean it up. Put the cans back in the bag. Lift it up. Put it back where it belongs. Wait a minute. What's in this bag, anyway? <laughs> oh, I don't believe it. It can't be. It, it flat out can't. Excuse me, sister. Is this the Delancey Street Mission House? It is. Could I get something to eat, sister? Will you take a seat with the others? Have yourself a nice cup of coffee. Oh, oh, sure. Dinner will be served after the sermon. Gotcha. Uh, I mean, okay. <laughs> Thank you, sister. God bless you. Have a seat. At least the coffee's hot. I sit down and take a load off. Uh, the sermon ain't so bad. No, it don't take long. Here's a chair. Uh, don't mind if I do. All right, what is this all about? You, the noise, the commotion, you. What is the idea of barging in and disrupting our Christmas Eve? Begging your pardon, Sister Florence. I ain't touched a drop since last Thursday, and that's the gospel truth. But I swear to you right now... You on mustn't swear. On a kind of... I seen him with my own eyes. He's coming. Who? Him. Him. Santa Claus is coming to town. Oh, I thank you for the thought. He's coming up the street heading this way, and he's given everybody their heart's desire. Oh, yeah, sure. Santa Claus? Are you kidding me? Pour yourself a cup of coffee. Black. Merry Christmas! I told you, sister, it's him. Now, what'll be your pleasure this year, gentlemen? How about you? Me? Yes, siree. Well, I'd sort of like to have a new pipe. Ha <laughs> ha Let me take a look at my bag. Here you go. A new Mersham. How's that? Oh, thank you. Thank you kindly. How about you? Uh, a woolen sweater? A woolen sweater you shall have. Size? Well, who cares? Here you go. Next. Some new shoes? How about some pipe tobacco? Uh, a carton of cigarettes? Another sweater, maybe? Slippers! A smoking jacket. Where did you get all these gifts? Sister Florence, <laughs> don't ask me to explain because I can't. I'm as much in the dark as anybody else. All I know is that I've got a bag here that gives everybody just what they want for Christmas. As long as it's put now, let's see here. What do you need? How about a new dress, sister? All wrapped up with a pretty ribbon for you. Well, we'll see about that. Don't you want your present? Let's open it for her. Well, looky, looky, an evening gown. And it's strapless. <laughs> there he is. There he is. That's the man. What's your name? Henry Corwin, officer. At least it was Henry Corwin. <laughs> Maybe now it's Mr. S. Claus or Chris Kringle. <laughs> I don't know anymore. <laughs> You're drunk, Corwin. Is that it? Naturally. Naturally, I'm drunk. I'm drunk with the spirit of the Yule. I'm intoxicated with the wonder that is Christmas Eve. I'm inebriated with joy and with delight. Yes, officer, I am quite indubitably drunk. <laughs> all right, all right. Hold on there. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. You can begin by handing over that bag of yours right now. Wait a minute. You got no call to... The bag? Or I'm placing you under arrest? You can't arrest Santa Claus. I sure can. 
and I can arrest every one of you. So let's have that bag, or we're all going down to the station house. You're hard of hearing. I I'm, I'm sure we can settle this. Yes, we can, Carlin. And in a hurry. I'd like to see just one little thing. And that would be? Show me the receipt for all this stuff. Right now. The receipt? You heard me. Of course, you've got a receipt. Well, go on, Henry. Show it to the policeman. Sure, you got one, ain't you? Mm, I'm afraid that's the one... the one thing I don't have in this bag. Sister Florence. Yes, officer. Collect all the stolen goods. What stolen goods? I put them in a pile over there. I'll see that they get claimed after I find out where he took the stuff from. Gladly. Come along, Santa. But you don't understand. Move. I want to report a missing person. Yes, ma'am. Fill out a report. Do I get a phone call? After you see the judge, now sit down. Can you take these handcuffs off? Ah, here we are. And here he is. And there you are, Mr. Dundee. Sit down, Corwin. And there that is. All the goods you've stolen. How nice to see you again. And how nice it will be to see you, my wistful St. Nicholas, going up the river. Do you suppose he could get as much as ten years, Officer Flaherty? Ten years? Ah, don't look good, Corwin. Of course, they might lop off a few months. If he was to tell us where the rest of the loot is stashed. The rest of it? You think there's a storehouse of some kind where I go to replenish it? Well, ain't there? Why, he may have been looting and pilfering for years. Now I understand. That's why he takes this job every December. He's been giving away stuff for two and a half hours. Must have a whole warehouse full of it. I'm glad you brought that up, officer. There's a little discrepancy here. Little discrepancy? Is that what you call it? Between this bag and what came out of it, did anybody see me go somewhere to fill it up? Because if they did, they're, they're lying or deluded. All right, you speak when you're spoken to, Corwin. Uh, I'm just trying to clear this up. Listen, you moth-eaten Robin Hood. The wholesale theft of thousands of dollars worth of goods is not a simple discrepancy. I wondered where my inventory went, and now I know. Let's take a look in the bag, shall we? You go right ahead, sir. Be my guest. Though I can tell you right now, Corwin, that this whole affair has come as no surprise to me. I perceived that criminal glint in your eyes the very moment I saw you. I'm not a student of human nature for nothing. I've personally spotted hundreds of shoplifters in my store over the years. I'll bet you tried, if you're any good at it. Quiet. And I can tell you that you fit the profile to a T. Then why did you hire me in the first place? Huh, an act of Christian charity on my part. I try and I try to do for you people. What people? And this is the thanks I get. Maybe if you tried hard enough, I wouldn't need a bag like this. All right, enough already. Mr. Dundee, you go ahead and you check in the bag. Believe it or not, I got other cases to handle here tonight. It will be a pleasure to achieve satisfaction. To catch him red-handed, as it were. Well, suit yourself, Mr. Dundee. Go ahead. Reach right in. Who let that cat in here? It was in the bag under all this... Uh, we'll be adding cruelty to animals to the charges now. Under what? Coffee grounds and empty tin cans? Looks like garbage to me, wouldn't you agree? He must have switched it. Where's the real bag? Uh, Mr. Dundee, you seem to have, um, put your finger on the problem. All your fingers, it looks like. <laughs> Messy, isn't it? Yeah, this isn't funny. No? Give me something to wipe my hands. Well, I guess the bag can't seem to make up its mind whether to give out gifts or garbage. Well, it was giving out gifts when I seen it. Whatever they wanted, Corwin was supplying. And it wasn't trash, neither. It was Christmas presents, toys, all kinds of things, expensive stuff, believe you me. You might as well admit it, Corwin. Oh, I admit it. Well, then, there you are. But I believe the essence of our problem here is that we're dealing with a most unusual bag. One that is both more and less than it seems. So you are some sort of magician con artist. A magician? <laughs> I love those guys. You know, this reminds me of a trick I saw once. Called himself Misto the Magnificent. Used to work down in Coney Island where they had those sideshows. He had a thing called the Never Empty Lotta. You know what a Lotta is, officer? What's your point, Corwin? A vase, uh, an urn, sort of. Uh, and he'd, he'd pour out water, glass after glass full, till it was empty. And, and then he'd pick it up and start all over again. Couldn't figure out how he did it. 
But this bag here, I guess it's like the never empty lotta. Only thing is, I'm no magician. I wouldn't know how to work it anyway. Whatever's going on, it's out of my hands. Some greater power is at work. I'm just the one who happened to be there at the right time and the right place. All right, no more talk. I told you I'm a busy man. For now, Corwin, my advice to you is clean up this mess and get out of my police station before I find a reason to book you. All right. If that's what you want, happy to oblige. Just, just like that? You're letting him go? My hands are tied. There's no evidence. And you, Officer Flaherty, call yourself a policeman? Hey, now. Well, I suppose it's a demanding task to distinguish between a bag full of garbage and an inventory of expensive stolen gifts. Too demanding for a civil servant whose salary is paid by my store city taxes. You can believe me, Mr. Dundee. It's just like Corwin says. We must be dealing with something supernatural here. Oh, in other words, all anyone needs to do is ask this man to make a little abracadabra for them, and no sooner said than done. I, I don't know how it works, but I can Well, go ahead. Prove it. I told you. I I'm no magician. Well, it seems miracles are the order of the day, aren't they? Now, don't go getting sacrilegious. You, you want me to drop the charges? Well, let's put him to a little test. I, I can't just pull a rabbit out of a hat. Oh, it's to be a rabbit now, is it? Instead of a cat? If you'd listen... <sighs> Let me see. I fancy... Oh, how about a bottle of cherry brandy? Vintage 1903, if your mystical bag is in the mood to deliver. 1903. That's a good year. A very good year. Hmm. Try this. I hope you like the gift wrapping. And as for you, Officer Flatter... Well, what? But I guess you two can share the bottle, can't you? What in heaven's name? Where did you get this? Enjoy it, gentlemen. I'll be going now. And to all, a good night. Well, let me open that package for you. You go right ahead. No telling what's inside. Well, would you look at that? Is it a real bottle? <laughs> Looks like one. Feels like it, too. It is a magic trick. It... It has to be. The old switcheroo. Either that or I'm dreaming, or I've gone completely mad. Now don't that beat all. 1903, just like you said. The card's even made out to you. To Mr. Dundee from Santa. There you go. You look like you need it, Mr. Dundee. Give me that. I don't believe it. It's cherry brandy. And a very fine one, I might add. Uh, just one more thing. Yeah? Would you mind terribly much passing the bottle before it's empty? Funny. The bag isn't that heavy. There he is! There's Santa! Come on, he's got presents! Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! I want a jacket and mittens! And a train! Diesel or steam? No, no, electric! And how about you? I'd like... well... Go on, say it. What's your heart's desire? A dolly, please. And what color hair would you like, darling? Blonde, brunette, red, or what have you? Anything's okay. Here you go. Blonde hair, just like you. Oh, thank you, Santa Claus. I love you. And a toy for you. And one for you. <sighs> what's the matter, Santa? Yeah, what's wrong? This bag's getting lighter and lighter. So, what's wrong with that? Well, there's so many folks who need things tonight. I'm just worried about what happens if... If what? What happens if I run out of presents? There it is. Midnight. Could have guessed it. Am I the last one? You are. Last present in this bag. If someone else needs it... Go ahead. I got mine already. Well, if you're sure it's all right. I don't see anybody else around, do you? No. Then here you go, ma'am. It's all yours. Thank you so much. I hope it's something you can use, my dear. Oh, 
It is a beautiful new blanket to keep out the cold. Thank you so much. Don't mention it. Yep, looks like your bag's empty, all right. That it is. So, what are you gonna do now? Oh, I'll go on home, I guess. Nothing left to do. Good idea. How about you, old fellow? Me? I can find lots of good places to sleep tonight. Only this time I got these great big old socks you give me to keep me warm. <laughs> Hope they fit. Oh, they're gonna fit just fine. Oh, hey, Santa. Oh, can I call you that? Well, might as well. One last time. I kind of like it. I was thinking... That can be dangerous, my friend. Well... It just ain't right. What isn't? What do you get out of it? Well, don't worry about me. I, I, I have had the best Christmas of anybody ever. With nothing for yourself? Not a single thing? Just the best Christmas since... since the beginning of time. Their faces, the look in their eyes. Do you know something? I can't think of anything I want. Not a single thing. Aw, oh, quit joshing me. I'm serious. When I look around, I... I think the only thing I ever wanted was to be able to do something like this. To be the biggest gift giver ever, so folks would feel a little bit better, at least for a while. And in a way, I've had that tonight. A real pleasure. I'm just sorry it has to end. Well, sure, but you could use something. Well, if I did have a choice, any choice at all of a gift. Go on, you're entitled. I guess I'd wish I could do this every year. Now, that... Would be some kind of gift, wouldn't it? A lot of work, though. It'd be worth it. That'd sure be something. <laughs> well, you take her easy now. God bless you. And a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Santa. Oh, and thanks for the car. Don't mention it. Whew, I might beat. Now, how'd I get here? That's the alley. Guess I better put the bag back where I found it. What's all this? Looks like somebody's throwing out their Christmas decorations already. That's no decoration. That's your sled. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> a sled and a reindeer right here in the alley just for me. Somebody sure made the eyes look real. He is real. Yeah, about as real as you are, little fella. Little fella. We've been waiting for you. And I suppose you're going to tell me you're a real elf, too. I sure am. We've been waiting for you to come back. Say, so, where did you rent your costume? I never saw one look that good. Pointed hat, turned up toes. Costume? I made this myself, by hand. A and the little bells? Must have been a heck of a party. It better be a costume, because I haven't had a drink in... Uh-oh. Oh, no. What's the matter, Santa? No, no, not me. You got the wrong guy. No, I haven't. Did you hear what I said? We've been waiting quite a while, Santa Claus. Better get a move on. We've got a whole year of hard work ahead to get ready for next year. Ready? Come over here. Yes, Santa? Pinch me. If you say so. Ow! You don't have to do it that hard. Are you ready now? I... I don't know. Come on, get in. There's plenty of room. Where? In this sleigh. You sure you don't have the wrong person? Oh, Santa, stop joking and get in. We're late. I don't have to. I, I, I could turn around right now and go home. If you do that, a lot of people would be very sad. Next year. You wouldn't lie to me. Elves can't lie. Okay. Okay. Move over, Shorty. Now, how do you work these reins? Night, Officer Flaherty. Night, Mr. Dundee. So long, fellas. My regards to everybody in the precinct. And a Merry Christmas to you both. Night, boys. See you all in the morning. Watch yourself out there. It's mighty cold. <laughs> now, don't you worry about me. Tonight, I'm feeling no pain. Going home now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Flaherty? That I am. Going home, Mr. Dundee. Assuming I can find me way. I'm sure you will. Left foot, right. 
left and right. Try to walk the straight line to the lamppost. Uh, where? Over there. Hang, hang on, I'll hold you up. Uh, and you, Mr. Dundee, home is it? Home, Mr. Flaherty. Well, I'll walk you a ways, if you don't mind. We could stop off for a nightcap. Well, now there's a pub right around the corner. That is a thought. Uh, just a nip, you know. Uh, to warm the soul. For thy stomach and thy infirmities. Isn't that what the good book says? I do believe it does, Mr. Dundee. You know something else, officer. Uh, now, why don't you tell me? That's what friends are for. Uh, that they are. <laughs> so go ahead now. Tell me all about it. Well, sir, this is the most remarkable Christmas I've ever had. You don't say. F -f Flaherty, did you see it? Did you? I thought I saw something. What did you see? No, 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 you first. Mr. Dundee, I don't think I'd better tell you. You'd report me for drinking on duty. But you're not on duty. True. Go ahead, what did you see? Mr. Dundee, it was that Corwin fella playing his life in a sleigh with reindeer sitting alongside a... A, a, a what? One of his little helpers. So help me. All done up in proper costume. They were riding towards the sky. Big as you please. One question for you. Yeah? Did we drink a whole bottle of cherry brandy back in the station house? Vintage 1903. But only one bottle. The finest I ever tasted. So I guess that's about the size of it then, isn't it, Mr. Dundee? Flaherty... You better come on home with me. We'll make some hot coffee. Yeah, and pour a little whiskey in it. We call that Irish coffee, you know. Oh, I do know. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk some more about all this. Sort it out. What is there to say? If a man can't believe his own eyes, what can he believe? Then... Oh, well, thank God for miracles, Mr. Flaherty. That we will, Mr. Dundee. That we will. A word to the wise, to all the children of our times, whether their concern be pediatrics or geriatrics, whether they crawl on hands and knees and wear diapers, or walk with cane and comb their beards, there is a wondrous magic to Christmas, and there is a special power reserved for little people. In short, there is nothing mightier than the truly meek. And so, a Merry Christmas to each and all, and to all a good night from those of us here in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Night of the Meek, starring Chris McDonald with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling and adapted for radio by Dennis Etcheson. Heard in the cast were Taylor Miller, Turk Muller, Doug James, Peter DeFaria, Peggy Roter, Adam Tangway, Richard Hensel, Meg Falcon, Lucas Ellman, Zach Gray, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, Rick Peoples, and Lauren Patton. 
To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. Unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. And finally, boys and girls, I hope you've all been to the school library. We'll begin book reports on Monday. Till then, have a happy Thanksgiving. Walk, please. No running. And button your coats. It's cold outside. Knock, knock. Oh, hi, Lynn. Did you get your car fixed? Not yet. You're kidding. It was supposed to be ready yesterday. Something about a part they had to order. Well, come on. I'll give you a ride home. It's only a few blocks. Don't be silly. You're right on the way. I have to straighten up first. Straighten what? Your classroom looks better than mine. You know, Helen, they have people who come in after we're gone. They're called janitors. <laughs> I know. You're very kind, really. But I, I have to... I, I have to, um... Have to what? Who's that? Where? In the hall. I don't hear anything. That song... Hello? Is someone there? What, what's the matter? I thought I heard a child. Take a look. All the kids are gone, and we're off for four whole days, okay? Now grab your stuff, and let's get out of here. We can have a drink, if you want. I know a perfect little place. I don't know. I do. Trust me, they have a great happy hour, and you won't believe the men. From the bank, and that new office building downtown... You go ahead. I'm fine. Oh, I get it. Hot date tonight, huh? Nothing like that. I, I have a test to grade. So, you've got till Monday. I know, but maybe some other time. All right, be that way. Get your papers. I'll walk you out. How long has it been now? Hmm? Since you started teaching. Oh, about a year. Two next spring. Then don't you think it's time to loosen up? Do something for yourself once in a while. You know what they say, all work and no play. I go out sometimes. Yeah? When? Well, see. It's just that with all the homework and the extra credit... You spend more time on it than they do. You know something? It sounds funny, but I really don't mind. I mean it, Lynn. Kids grow up so fast, they need all the help they can get. They're not the only ones. But they seem so... vulnerable. Well, maybe they are. But they survive. The bumps and bruises, the sore throats and earaches, it all works out, one way or the other. Look at us. What? We made it, didn't we? In spite of everything, we survived? I guess. <laughs> Don't ask me how. I'm parked across the street. Last chance. Careful, the light's about to change. <laughs> Come on, Helen. We don't have to wait for the crossing guard. We're grown-ups, remember? That man. What man? In the car. Mmm. Sort of distinguished. Don't stare. He's staring at you. Have you seen him before? Not around here. I'd remember. Lynn, do you ever see people? And they remind you of someone, but you're not sure who? Someone you might have met once and... <laughs> All the time. The trouble is, they don't remember me. It's just a feeling I get sometimes. Sorry, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'll open your side. Get in. No, I'll walk. But it's freezing. It's alright, honestly. It'll give me a chance to think. Are you sure? I'm sure. See ya. Hey! You have some place to go on Thanksgiving? What? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Dr. Anderson's. Doctor, huh? You didn't tell me about him. 
<laughs> He's an old friend of the family. Well, if it doesn't work out, you can always come over to my place. I'm cooking a really big bird. Thanks, Lynn. Call me later. I will. November. A wind stirs. Leaves blow in the streets. And people move a little bit faster just to get home before dark. To this, add a young woman named Helen Foley, age 28, who has a calling. She believes in helping children whenever and wherever she can. Taken all together, these are the improbable ingredients of a basic human emotion called fear. And the recipe is almost complete. All that's needed now is the face of a little girl, as perfect as a cameo and as solemn as a sphinx. Because Helen Foley is about to learn the properties of terror, in a few moments, a most unusual child will take her by the hand and lead her on a journey into the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Nightmare as a Child, starring Bonnie Somerville with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hello? Is anybody there? It's all right, sweetheart. You don't have to be afraid. I'm not. Well, hi. Hello. And how are you? Fine. You're new here, aren't you? What? Just that I've never seen you before. You haven't? Are you visiting? Is that it? Are you visiting someone in the building? Not exactly. You aren't very talkative, are you? Not much to say? Actually, that's good. That's very good. It's not wise to talk to strangers. I don't. I guess I'm a stranger. But it's all right. I'm kind of an expert on children. Quiet ones and noisy ones. All kinds. I know. You do? But how would you know that? I'll bet you don't know that I teach school. I know all about you. I see. I even know what you're going to do. Do you? You're going inside. Because this is your apartment. You're right. It is. Would you like some hot chocolate, honey? Well... On cold afternoons when I come back from school, that's the first thing I usually make. A nice cup of hot chocolate. But no marshmallows. What? You don't like marshmallows, do you? Why, no. As a matter of fact, I've never liked them. I don't either. All right, then. Absolutely no marshmallows. Here we are. Aren't you coming in? If you want me to. Oh, you really should tell your mother where you are. Why? I wouldn't want her to worry. She won't. Well, if you're sure, go ahead and sit down. The couch is over by the... Oh, I see you found it. I'll just take off my coat before I put the milk on. You don't have to hurry. All right, but I can hardly wait to have that cocoa. It's awfully chilly, don't you think? Mm-hmm. So, tell me, are you in school? In a way. What grade are you in? Different ones. Different? It depends. My, you must be very smart then. What brings you to this floor? I mean, if you don't live in the building. Of course, if you do live here. I came to see someone. Oh? I thought so. A friend of yours? Sort of. What's her name? Maybe I know her. Maybe you do. Really? I must say, you've caught my curiosity. Don't let it get too hot. Hmm? The milk. Oh, yes, thank you. It didn't start to boil yet. Good. Here we are. I hope I didn't make it too rich. No, it looks just right. Careful. It might be hot. It's fine. I'm glad it isn't too hot. I don't like hot things very much. Mm, I don't blame you. I don't either. I know. You got burned once. What? A long time ago. With hot tea. How did you know that? I just do. You still have a scar. 
right below your elbow. But how could you... When you were a little girl, a pot of tea fell off the stove. You were playing in the kitchen. That's how you got burned. Is it? Don't you remember? Well, why, no, I, I didn't remember. Until just now, when, when you said it. My arm, yes. My arm. How could you forget that? There are a lot of things I've forgotten. What kind of things? Things that took place when I was a certain age. It seems like a different life now. Does it? Something else must have happened to me then, a long time ago. I'm not sure exactly what it was. But there are some things that I'm, I'm rather vague about. I know that too. How in the world? I know all about you, remember? Yes. Yes, I do remember you're saying that. What's the matter? Nothing, I just... I think I've had enough cocoa for now. Is that why you're going to the window? To open it? Because you're hot? I'm not going to open the window, that's ridiculous. It's too cold outside to open the window. In fact, I hear there's a storm coming tonight. There is. You know that too, I suppose. Yes. What else do you know? Oh, about people. Which people? The ones you see when you're walking. When I'm walking? They look familiar to you sometimes. Now why ever would you say that? When you pass them on the street, or see them in a bank, or they walk by you. They look like somebody you used to know, don't they? Well, w once in a while. But when you try to remember where you saw them, you can't. No matter how hard you try. I wouldn't say it's quite like that. Yes, it is. It happens lots of times. Like today. Today? Did somebody go by you today who looked familiar? Why, why no? Really? It's not very polite to contradict people. I told you, I... I didn't... Didn't what? Nothing. You just remembered, didn't you? There was someone. That's right. Outside the school, you were crossing the street. There was a man in a car. A man in a car, yes. Stopped for a light. I looked at him through the windshield as I walked past, and then he drove on, but I wondered... You recognized him? No. No, I didn't recognize him. He just looked so... So familiar to you? Yes. He made you frightened, didn't he? I really don't know what business it is of yours. But he did. It's okay. He makes me feel that way, too. You know him? I don't know his name. He looks familiar, though. Like somebody I saw once. In a dream. And I know he frightens me. Just like he frightens you. That's ridiculous. Is it? Who are you? I told you. No, you didn't. Where do you live? Around here. What's your name? Don't look away from me. Do you have a name? Marky. That's not my real name, but that's what people call me. I said it's Marky. Did you hear me? Yes. Yes, I heard you. Marky. That's a... that's a pretty name. It's my nickname. Is that all you've got to say? I think it's a very cute name. What more do you want me to say? I thought it might remind you of something. Well, it doesn't. Feeling warm again? No, I'm not, thank you. Then why do you have sweat on your forehead? What? Oh. You're right, it, it does seem a little warm in here now. I don't think so. I think it's very comfortable. No, it's warm. Strange, I haven't turned the heater on yet. What's that? I didn't hear anything. I did. Oh, that was the front door of the building, down below. What floor is he going to? How would I know? He's coming here, to the fifth floor. Well, we're not the only people on this floor. There are four other apartments. I know, but he's coming to this one. Is he? I have to go. Honey, there's nothing to be afraid of, I promise. There is. Do you have a back door? Yes, but... I'm going now. Wait, please. Goodbye. I'll come back later. <gasps> Who is it? Miss Foley. Uh, Miss Helen Foley? Miss Foley, do I have the right apartment? Who is it, please? It's Peter Selden, Miss Foley. 
I don't know whether you remember me, but I, uh, I knew your mother very well. Who? Ah. Oh. That's oh, better. Mr... Well, do you remember me now? Why... Why, you do look familiar. Ah, that's a start. Didn't I see you? <laughs> I thought you looked at me a little oddly. Yes, yes, that's right. In front of the school, I was stopped for a red light. So you were. Uh, do you mind if I come in for a moment? Why, no. Please do. Thank you. Won't you sit down, Mr... Uh, Selden. A friend of my mother's, you say? I'm not sure I... It's been a lot of years, Miss Foley. Quite a few, indeed. Uh, 18 or 19 at the very least. That long? Then I must have been... Got you stumped, huh? <laughs> well, it's no wonder. As you were just a child then. You couldn't have been more than 10 or 11. Uh, but I remember you. See, I used to work for your mother. Peter Selden, her financial consultant. Any bells yet? I do seem to recall the name... I'd heard that you, well, after the tragedy, you were ill for a time. Isn't that right? Yes. Quite some time. What were you able to recall? Pardon? You said you seemed to recall... Um, not sure. It was all so terrible. In that time of, of recuperation, afterwards... No, 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 I, I, I shouldn't bring this up. No, it's all right. Well, in all those weeks and months, were you able to recall what it was that... <clears throat> what I mean is, Miss Foley, you drew a blank after that evening. I wondered if it ever came back to you. Any of the details uh, to help with the investigation. That evening? The evening of the tragedy, when your your poor mother was killed. I don't know that I... No, it, it, it must be very painful to even think of it. I, I, I should apologize. No, it, it comes back to me in pieces sometimes. Only vague, disjointed things, that's all. I suffered from shocks. Hmm. Trauma, the doctors called it. And then it, it, it took me a while. I, I was in therapy for a long time. After I got better, I, I moved to Chicago. I lived with an aunt there. Yeah, so I'd heard. I've only been back here for a year or so. I teach elementary school. Yes, I'd heard that, too. You'll forgive my interest, but I remembered you so well. I always wondered what became of you. Then I was passing through town on business, and, well, someone pointed you out to me, and I... I just felt I had to stop and say hello. I'm glad you did, truly. Your mother was a very special woman. Yes, she was. You say you worked for her. I still can't quite... I worked for her almost a year. I handled some of her investments at the time. Yes, there was someone. Selden, you say? That's right. But enough of the past. It's wonderful to know that you've grown up the way you have. I, I don't know how wonderful it is. And now you've become a special woman, too, in your own right. Very, very special. As anyone can see. Oh, I should have known. It couldn't have been any other way. <laughs> Please, Mr. Selden. There's nothing in the least special about me. I live alone. I go to work in the mornings, come home. Nothing at all out of the ordinary, believe me. Well, on the contrary. You know, I was always quite fond of you. Such a beautiful little girl. Long, golden hair. All children are beautiful at that age. <laughs> Not to such a degree. Then I'm afraid your memory may be playing tricks on you. No, no, I remember it all perfectly. I lived in the same apartment complex. I heard you screaming that night. I was the first one to find her. Miserable. Tragic thing to be attacked like that for no reason. They, uh, they never found the person who did it, did they? No, no, I don't think they did. Though I can't be sure. I'm not sure about anything that went on then. It just sort of left my mind, all of it. Oh, that's probably a blessing. At least for you. All I remember is a kind of vague, nightmarish feeling. Waking up in bed, hearing my mother scream, and seeing this... this person. You, uh, you saw his face? I don't know, I, I really don't. If I did, it's one of the many things I've forgotten, or at least pushed out of my mind. Pity for the police. There's no statute of limitations on murder, you know. The police did all they could under the circumstances. So tell me, Mr. Selden, are you here for a while? No, 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 I'm just passing through. So you said, I forgot. Well, I'm delighted you stopped. The pleasure is mine. Excuse me for a second, would you? Oh, certainly. Hello? Helen? 
sorry to bother you. Dr. Anderson, how are you? Very well. And you, my dear? Oh, I'm fine. Just a little cold in the apartment is all. They say there's a storm coming. I don't mean to intrude, but I wanted to remind you about tomorrow night. Tomorrow? Thanksgiving dinner. Come as early as you like. And please don't bring a thing. We have more than enough food. You know, I really should be going. No, please. I'll be right with you. You have a visitor? That's all right. A friend of my mother's. And uh, who might that be? Someone who worked with her. Hmm. How do you feel about that? Any anxiety? No, I think I remember him. You do? You've never mentioned him before? It's beginning to come back. He worked with her on some things. We'll talk about this tomorrow. For now, I want you to make note of any associations that come to mind. If you're troubled by any new recollections, call me at once. I'm always available, my child. Thank you, Doctor. I will. I promise. I've kept you too long. I'll be going now. I'm sorry. Wouldn't you care for a coffee first or, or a cup of cocoa? <laughs> it looks like you already poured one for yourself. I interrupted you. And now it has gone cold. <laughs> this cup? Why, it's not mine. I put mine in the sink. It's... Something the matter, Miss Foley? That's odd. What is? She'd almost finished her cocoa, or at least I thought she had, but here it sits, untouched. That is odd. But she's a rather odd little thing herself. You're referring to... The little girl who was in here, just before you came. Strangest little thing. So solemn, so... so wise, you might say. That's the only way I can describe her. Well, I'll say goodbye now. I must ask her how she does that. <laughs> does what? Her trick. Sitting there sipping cocoa and leaving a full cup. Yes, that sounds like a regular magician. Little Marky, I mean. Marky. That's her nickname. She wouldn't tell me her real name. Marky, that's what she calls herself. You don't say. Don't you care for the name, Mr. Selden? Oh, in fact, I like it very much. That was your nickname, Miss Foley, when you were a little girl. They call you Marky. Marky. Something wrong? What? Oh, nothing's wrong. Except that it's quite a coincidence. This little thing camping on my doorstep having the same name as I did. <laughs> I, I suppose it is. Now that's odd, too. I'm sorry, what is? The way things are coming back. Oh? You're right. I was called Marky. I haven't thought about it in years. But that is what people called me, isn't it? I'm sure that given time, you'll remember a lot more. Is, uh... Is that what the doctor said? Dr. Anderson? Yes, that the memories would come back gradually? He doesn't know. None of them do. You're looking a bit pale. Yeah, perhaps you should sit down. No, I'm all right. I was just listening. Full of talents, our little Marky. Well, how do you mean? Her singing, for one. Oh, she sang for you. She's singing now. I don't hear anything. Has she stopped? I mean that. Listen. Uh, to what? Her singing. Can't you hear the singing? No. I guess... I, I guess you have better ears than I do. She's stopped now. Oh, there's something else. It almost slipped my mind. I'm really surprised you couldn't hear her. It was very plain. What's that? I thought you might like to have this. It's a snapshot. Yeah, see? But how... Look at those golden curls, the eyes. Oh, she looks so much like her mother. Wouldn't you agree? Where did you get this? Your mother gave it to me a long time ago. So very much like your mother now. Why, when you, when you opened the door and I got a good look at you, I, I was... I don't understand. What, Miss Foley? I'm sorry, what don't you understand? This... It's a picture of the little girl, the one who came here today. A picture of Marky. <laughs> Don't laugh at me, I'm telling you. I'll do something about it. I will. Shut up. You... Mommy? Help me, please. Help me. Silence. Marky? What are you doing sitting out there? 
playing with my doll. Did that man leave yet? He left some time ago. I must have fallen asleep on the couch. Marky, it's very late. Is it? Past your bedtime. Don't you think you should go home now? Your mother will be terribly worried. No, she won't. She won't be worried at all. Yes, she will. I don't have a mother. Not anymore. You don't have a... Do you remember now? About Marky? Do you, Helen? I think I'm beginning to. And the time you burned your arm with the hot water from the teapot? Yes. Yes, that too. You got a nasty burn. What are you doing? Showing you my arm. Here's the scar. Just below the elbow. Let me see that. The same as on your arm. Who are you? What's your real name? You better let go. You're hurting me. I'll let go, but first I want to know who you are. I want to know where you're from and what your true name is. Tell me. Do you understand? Tell me. You don't know? You don't have any idea? And you were doing so well, Helen. You were starting to remember things. What things? Remember what things? What's that? Where? On the coffee table. I wanted to ask you about this picture. Mr. Selden left it. Is it familiar? He said that's supposed to be me. That's supposed to be me when I was a little girl about your age. But it isn't. It isn't me at all. It's you, Marky. And that's impossible, too. How could it be? You and that's still don't understand, do you? Understand what? And that's impossible. But I'm you, Helen. And what? Now, and that's impossible. Dan, do you? I'm you. What? Now, and that's a talk is me. I'm you. I'm you. What? Now, and that's a I'm you when you were you. I'm old. You. What? Now, and that's a Marky when you were you. I lived with your mother in now, the other and apartment. You were I was asleep in the bed that night. It was so cold. And the man came to visit. And your mother let him in. I don't know what you're talking about. I think you do. He was arguing with mother downstairs, and she tried to run away. And downstairs. she ran upstairs to her room. And the man came after her and caught her. And he choked her. Remember, Helen? Yes. He choked her, and then... Then he picked up something heavy, and he hit her on the head, and she fell. And then... Then you screamed. And the man looked down at you. He looked right at you. And you screamed, Helen. You screamed so loud. The storm. It was raining that night, too. The lights, they've gone off. Marky? Stay close to me. I'll light a candle. I have one somewhere. Marky? Marky, where are you? Be careful. Who's there? Uh, take it easy, Helen. It's only me. Lynn! Oh, God, I thought... What Thought what? I don't know. I fell asleep on the couch, and I must have been dreaming an awful dream. I, I shouldn't have walked in like that, but I heard your voice, and the door was open. You okay? Oh, come in, please. I got to thinking about you, over here, alone. I'll bet you haven't eaten. Actually, no, but... So I thought. I'll stop by, and if you're hungry, we'll order something to go. You must be soaked. I got here just in time. Now the power's gone out. It looks like the whole block. I was looking for a candle. Now where are those matches? I've got some. Here. Great, thanks. Who were you talking to? Oh, that was Marky. Nice name. Where have you got him hidden? <laughs> it's a little girl. I want you to meet her. Maybe you can tell me if what she says is... Marky, honey, you can come out now. I don't see anybody. She was here, I swear. It's raining really hard, but we can still order Chinese. They deliver. Yes. Yes, I'd like that. Oh, something hot. Sweet and sour, whatever. What's the number? I think it's... Oh, no. What? There's no dial tone. The phone lines must be down. I'll make us some coffee. How far is the restaurant? Just at the corner. Then I'll go get some stuff. No, I couldn't let you do that. Don't worry about it. You have an umbrella, don't you? Yes, but... Plus, I've got my car. No problem. Honest. I'll get soup and everything. The works. Then I'm paying. Just let me get my purse. You are too nice, Lynn. <laughs> Tell that to my last date. Here. That should be enough. I'll get the coffee going. Be back in a flash. I'll get an extra fortune cookie in case your little friend shows up. Where did you say the umbrella... Behind the door. Got it. Don't open it indoors. It's bad luck.
<laughs> if you say so. Is she your friend? Marky! Her name's Lynn, isn't it? Where were you, in the other room? She's nice. Not like that man. Mr. Selden? You're wrong about him, Marky. He's very nice. He just stopped by to say hello. He's an old friend. No, he's not. You don't even remember him. But you've seen him before. I know I have. Is it coming back yet? Is what coming back? The last time you saw him, before today. I don't know what you're talking about. Now sit down, and I'll make you some fresh hot chocolate. Hear that? Someone's coming. She must have forgotten something. Lynn, is that... Hello again, Miss Foley. Mr. Selden? What are you... We didn't quite finish our conversation. Where's Lynn? Oh, I wouldn't worry about her. Why do you say that? That's just it, Miss Foley. There are things you don't understand. See, we need to talk. In private. I want to bring you up to date. You've been living in ignorance too long. My friend's coming right back. Any minute now. I seriously doubt it. At the moment, she's resting quietly in her car outside. I'm sure no one will notice her until tomorrow morning, the earliest. What are you saying? I want to impart some knowledge, Miss Foley. Obviously, it's begun to come back to you in bits and pieces, as you say. I should be the first, don't you think? It's only appropriate, you see, because I was the man in your mother's condo that night. The one who followed her up the stairs to her room. The one you saw, however briefly. Get out or I'll scream. Oh, I'm afraid that wouldn't do any good. There are people in the other apartments. No. No, they're all empty. It's Thanksgiving week. Or have you forgotten that too? They're away visiting their families. You're alone on this floor. Eh, quite alone. Stay away from me. Oh, I plan to. I'll be long gone and no one will know I was here. Even your doctor friend doesn't know my name. Just as soon as I tell you about how I killed your mother. But why? Why? Well, there was some trouble with the books. I pleaded with her to cover for me, but your mother, rest her soul, was a particularly rigid, straight-laced woman, and she was about to inform on me. When she went upstairs to the bedroom, I had to follow her. If only you had stayed in your room. I would have gone after you next, but your screams brought people there, and I had to get out in a hurry. It wasn't until later that I learned you had no recollection of who you saw. You blacked out the entire incident. Don't worry about the candle. I can see you in the lightning. There you are. Let me go! You haven't been neglected all these years, Helen. I've kept tabs on you. Chicago, college, then here. Yeah, I knew there'd come a day when the pieces would finally fit together. And you'd start to remember. That's why I came back. I had to come back. To take care of unfinished business. You're the only person who knows exactly how your mother died. What are you going to do? Oh, a simple fall, I should think. It was dark, you tripped on the stairs. Only that much more believable with the power outage. Come on, come with me, Helen. We're going out onto the landing. No, 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 don't look down. It'll be easier that way. No! No! Oh. Here. Oh! Oh, look at the kick you have there. Oh, don't bother to run. There's only one way down. Help me! Somebody please help me! Oh, come along, Helen. You know I'll find you, even in a darkened hallway. You keep away from her. Well, well. Who do we have here? Don't you know? That voice. I'll light the candle so you can see. Wretch, you Marky, look out! The stairs! Yes, the stairs. And more step. And watch out, mister. Wherever I go, you're going with me. You... No! Marky! Marky!
55 years of age. Hey, Fran, want to get a picture of the body? Sure thing, Lieutenant. How is she, Doc? Going to be all right? I have given her a sedative. She's a very fortunate woman. If she were any less fortunate, we'd have a homicide victim on our hands. At least that's the way she tells it. So where's the other one? Arthur? Uh, she keeps talking about some kid, says a little girl fell downstairs with him. There is no other body. Only the man. Name of Selden, according to his ID. The child she speaks of. That is her. What? A part of her, buried deep inside. A memory that finally had to come out. It took the form of herself as a child. <laughs> Too weird for me, Doc. Well, the human imagination itself is weird. But sometimes in a crisis, it could mean the difference between life and death. Here's her other friend, Lieutenant. Just like she said, found her in a car half a block down. Somebody slugged her on the head and dumped her inside. Helen? Where's Helen? Oh, she's doing okay. Just a couple of bruises. Take it easy, young lady. I want to see her. There's plenty of time for that. You're both going to County General to get checked out. Here's the ambulance now, sir. Lynn, is that you? Here. I'm here. Back to work. I was sick for a while, but now I'm better. I have a whole classroom full of kids about your age. They're waiting for me. Oh, are you a teacher? Yes, I am. You know something? What? You have a lovely smile. I do? It's wonderful, truly. Do me a favor. Don't ever lose it. My dolly has a smile, too. See? Yes, you both have wonderful smiles. If you're still here later, I'll make us a nice cup of hot chocolate. Would you like that? Oh, yeah. Good. I'll see you then. Take care of yourself. Take good care. Miss Helen Foley, who lived for a time in darkness and woke up from a nightmare, who found a spot on the tapestry of her life and rubbed it clean then stepped back and got a good look at what she had left behind in the Twilight Zone. Please like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. Nightmare as a Child, starring Bonnie Somerville, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Hetchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Dana Bokor, Roger Mueller, Elizabeth Lido, David Darlow, Roderick Peoples, Doug James, Jeff Lupiton, Linda Ryder, Meg Falcon, and Amanda Amari. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group and Westwood One. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, starring John Schneider with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Frenette Lebo, Anne Whitney, Richard Hensel, Meg Falcon, Amber Lake, Roderick Peoples, Roger Mueller, Doug James, Tom McElroy, Jen Patterson, Kurt Navig, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, 
Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Uh, nurse? Here you are, Mr. Wilson. You ready for some lunch? Oh, no, no thanks. I, I was just... Lovely morning, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. I thought I'd wait outside. I, I was wondering... You're getting some color in your face. I am? A picture of health. Your wife will be pleased. About my wife. Do you know when she's arriving? When she's... Th to pick me up. Oh, this is the big day? <laughs> it is, yeah, yes. Well, you'll have to check with Dr. Martin, but I'm sure it won't be long. If you'd like to say your goodbyes to the others... I'd better pack first. Oh, naturally. It's good to see you doing so well. Thank you for everything. Not at all. Oh, and Nurse... Yes? If my wife should get here in the next few minutes, t tell her I'm in my room, would you please? Of course. She's a lucky woman. <laughs> You've done wonders for my self-esteem. I don't know what I'll do without you. You'll do fine, Mr. Wilson. Just fine. Ah, Wilson. I was looking for you. You, you were... Something wrong? N no, no, uh, Doctor. It's just, just that plane. What about it? It's, does it always fly directly over the grounds? Every day, on its way to the airport. Guess I never noticed. Perhaps you chose not to, until you were ready. Then I guess I must be cured. You've come a long way, my boy. Or I wouldn't have signed the release. I wanted to ask you, what time will Ruth be here? I believe she said half past twelve. Isn't that right? Yeah, yes, but I thought she might have been delayed if there was a last-minute change of plans. Relax. That's probably her plane now. Do you think so? Would you mind stopping by my office before you leave? I wanted to go over a few things with the both of you. Don't worry about me, Doctor. That's all behind me. Eager to get back home, I'm sure. To your job, your life. Just remember, there's no rush. One step at a time. You know, it's strange, but... I actually feel better now than before it happened. Not strange in the least. I prefer to think of it as a kind of timeout. Something most people could use. Most people don't have nervous breakdowns. Only the best people. Oh, come on, Doctor. That's very nice of you, but... I'm serious. Like a piece of fine china. The better the quality, the more likely it is to crack under stress. Oh, human beings aren't china plates, of course. Considerably more complicated. But when a bone fractures, it heals and grows back even stronger. I believe it's that way with the mind. Now that is the finest pep talk I've ever heard. I wish everyone would stop worrying about me. I never felt better in my life. Portrait of a Once Frightened Man. Mr. Robert Wilson, 37, husband, father, and salesman. Now on the road to recovery. Mr. Wilson is ready for discharge from a sanitarium where he has spent the last six months of his life. This is the result of a nervous breakdown, the onset of which took place on a day not dissimilar to this and on an airliner very much like the one in which Mr. Wilson is about to fly home. The difference being that on that day, half a year ago, Mr. Wilson's flight was interrupted by the onslaught of mental illness. Tonight, however, he will make it all the way to his appointed destination, which, contrary to the flight plan, happens to be a landing strip in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, 
Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, starring John Schneider, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Flight 713, now boarding at gate 12. All passengers for flight 713, please have your boarding passes ready. That's us. Is it? I have the tickets right here. We're already checked in. All we have to do is get on the plane. Good. That's good. <laughs> um, do you suppose... What, darling? Do I have time for a drink of water? Of course. It's just down the hall. Are you feeling all right? I'm fine. I'm just thirsty. Wait, you're perspiring. It's warm in here. Aren't you warm? Bob, take it easy. Remember what the doctor said, one step at a time. I know. You've been on plenty of planes in your life. Well, haven't you? This one's no different. I take your arm and we walk on together. When we get to our seats, you'll take a nap, and when you wake up... I'm perfectly fine, <laughs> really. I've got your pills. Good. They should help you sleep. Shall we? The line's getting pretty long. Honey? I said... Does this airport have a smoking area? Bob, you quit years ago. I know, I, I just thought one might help settle my stomach. It's something I ate. Try a few deep breaths. It isn't that. It, it isn't. I haven't been anywhere but the sanitarium for so long. I, I'm not used to this. The noise, the crowds. It'll be much quieter on the plane. Come on. Hold my hand. Okay. Final boarding call for flight 713. All passengers, please proceed to gate 12. Please keep the aisles clear. Uh, stow all the carry-on luggage overhead or under the seat in front of you. Here we are, honey. Great. Do you need any help, sir? What? If you'd like to take your coat off... I, I can do it myself. She's only trying to help, Bob. I thought you were warm. Right. I'll fold it and put it in the overhead for you. Ma'am? I'll keep mine for now. Do you have any pillows up there? Ah, uh, here you go. Thank you, stewardess. If you need anything else, you just let me know. I could use, uh, something to drink. Well, I'll bring the beverage cart as soon as we're underway. Great. Did you want the window seat? You can have it. Honestly, I don't care. It's almost dark out. Besides, if I'm on the aisle, I can get up without climbing over you. Are you sure? I'm sure. I, I mean, if you are. Doesn't make any difference. I shouldn't. Enough already. I'll, I'll take the window. Oh. I didn't notice. What's the matter? We're over the wing. Miss? Yes? This row, it's the emergency exit. Would you prefer to sit somewhere else? It's okay, R really. I think we would, if you don't mind. Well, I'll see what I can do. The seat isn't the problem, it's, it's, it's... The fact that we're on an airplane? That shouldn't bother me either, not if I'm a cured man. Honey... I don't act much like a cured man, do I? But you are. Would Dr. Martin let you fly if you weren't? I suppose not. Of course he wouldn't. If you weren't well, he'd never let you go home. It's as simple as that. You make it sound simple, anyway. Is, Bob. Just that simple. Yeah, look at me, hogging all the attention. You're the one who must be exhausted. I'm doing great. No lies, remember? Come here. Oh, Bob. I missed you, baby. All these months. Shh. It's over now. I'm taking you back where you belong. Must have been awful for you, the kids, all the responsibility. None the worse for wear. Everything's intact. Except me. Now, I am not going to let you talk. Excuse me. Yes? It looks like this is a full flight. I'm sorry, but I can't find any open seats. Do you mind terribly? No, no, not at all. We're, we're fine here. Thank you for trying. I'll bring you that drink first chance I get. What would you like? Just water. For you, ma'am? Nothing yet. Very well. What was that? They're closing the door, that's all. Hatch, whatever they call it. Here, let's look at the in-flight magazine. Fasten your seatbelts, please. Be sure your seats are in the upright position. Bob? No hmm? Seatbelt. Oh, oh, right. Here, let me get it for you. I, I could do it. I, would you relax? Please note the location of the emergency exits in the center and rear of the plane. 
Should there be a loss of cabin pressure, oxygen masks will drop down from the overhead console. Place the mask over your nose and mouth and breathe normally. You will find a life jacket under each seat. Place your arms through the holes and adjust the straps. Then pull the cord. The jacket will inflate automatically. Go back to sleep. Bob, what are you doing? I'm sorry, honey. I, I found a newspaper under the seat. The light must be bothering you. <sighs> oh, I should stay awake. No, no, no. I don't want you to, sweetheart. Go to sleep now. Can't you sleep? I, I will. Promise. You worry too much. I can't help it. You shouldn't. Not anymore. Bob, do you... Do I what? Are you comfortable talking about it? That night, I mean. What do you want to know? Well, Dr. Martin went over it, but I still don't understand. Well, neither do I, exactly, but I I have a, a pretty good idea what caused it now. You do? Well, it's no great mystery. Overwork, nervous tension, a touch of blood pressure. But why that night on that particular plane? What set it off? <sighs> I guess it was a lot of little things come together. Lack of sleep, fast food, years of being uptight. Oh, honey, you should have told me. I didn't know myself. I was holding everything in for the sake of the job, trying to think about nothing but facts and figures. There are other jobs. That's just it. There's nothing wrong with my job. I, I like it. Then why? Call it the perfect storm. When I wasn't working or home with you and the kids, I didn't know how to take it easy, so my imagination went on overtime. I Looked out the window and I thought I saw, I don't know what, clouds that looked like snow fields. Then someone skiing on that snow. Can you believe it? I just plain couldn't tell the difference anymore. It was a wake-up call, all right, in more ways than one. Thank God it's over and we're going home. Oh, Bob. Bob. Could you move your legs to the side? What? Oh, just, just for a second. I have to get out. Let me call the stewardess. She'll bring whatever... I have to go to the restroom, Ruth. It's no big deal. Oh. I'll be right back. Promise. Yes? Would you return to your seat, please? We've hit some turbulence. <clears throat> Just a moment. I wouldn't you know it. Okay, let's see how bad it is. Lord. That's not possible. Sir, please. I have to ask you Did to... you see that? You'll have to sit down and fasten your seatbelt. Don't alarm the others, but look outside. Return to your seat first and... Look out the window. Anyone, here! Lean down and tell me what you see. That man, what's he saying? No, I can't hear. He looks crazy. Too much to drink. They shouldn't serve him. If you don't sit down, I'll have to call the captain. For the love of God, woman, look! I know it's impossible, but... Tell me you don't see a man... A, no, a creature of some kind out there on the wing of the plane... You saw what? Out there! On the wing! See for yourself! Sir, I assure you... Open the curtain! What is it I'm supposed to see? There! In the lightning! He... Where? But... but he was there! I, I, I tell you, he... he... he, he fl floated down and, and landed on the wing! That's enough. Then he started walking toward the engine... Shh! There are children on board. I'm simply telling you what I saw. Need some help, Nancy. Would you show Mr. Wilson back to his seat? Certainly. 
I don't mean to upset anyone, but... This way, sir. All right. All, all right. I'm, I'm sorry. It, it, it must have been a reflection. Yes, it must have been. If you'll just come with me... I, I made a mistake. I'm, I'm going to my seat now. See? Now, sir. I didn't mean any harm, I, I tell you. Is something wrong, stewardess? A low-pressure pocket, that's all. The plane feels like it's dropping. Nothing to worry about. We'll be through it in a minute. Don't wake my wife. You can move around the cabin again as soon as the overhead light goes off. Yes. Of course. For now, I suggest you get some rest and stay in your seat. I understand. Hi. What is it? Would you like another pillow, Mrs. Wilson? No, I don't think so. A blanket? H how about some of those peanuts and uh, another glass of water? Surely, I'll be right back. Did something happen? It started to rain. Is that what it was? I just uh, saw something, that's all. Everybody has to stay in their seats for a while. What did you see? Nothing. You must have seen something. I, I happened to look outside just as the lightning flashed, and for a second I thought I saw something. Like what? Shadow. A shadow? In the shape of a man. Where? On the wing. Not a man. Exactly. What are you saying? A, a creature standing upright with long hair on its body and an animal face. Of course you know. That's all it was. A shadow. Of course. People don't walk around on the wings of airplanes. No, they don't. Not while they're moving hundreds of miles an hour. That would be impossible. Wouldn't it, Bob? It must have been a trick of the light. Like your imaginary skier. What? On the snow-capped clouds six months ago? The one you told me about? Yes, yes, I suppose so. And you know that wasn't real? No, it, it was. A hallucination of some sort. You must be more tired than you thought. But, um, I... I wasn't hallucinating just now. Then what would you call it? It was more the lines of uh, an optical illusion. My eyes playing tricks on me. Then don't look outside. Leave the curtain closed. Believe me, I intend to. You ought to get some sleep. So you'll be rested when we land. I agree. Need another pill? Ruth, I'm all right, I, I tell you. Couldn't hurt. If you say so. Where's my purse? Your water and some extra peanuts. Thank you, stewardess. You're welcome. Bob, put the tray down for her. Uh, sure. Are we moving into a storm? Not a big one. It's almost past. Oh, well, that's good. If I can get you anything else... We'll let you know. Here's your pill. Thanks. Sit. No, thank you. I'm not thirsty. I'm, so I'm sorry I woke you. Don't be silly. You can go back to sleep now if you like. If you do. G give me a minute. You're not... Worried about anything, are you? Not in the least. Then put your seat back. In a sec, just, just let me collect my thoughts. Well, don't overthink it. That never did any good. No, it didn't. You're here, with me. And we're going home, together. That's the most fantastic part of all. Well, you'd better get used to the idea. All better now? Yes. Nudge me if you need me. And whatever you do, don't open the curtain. How's the wind speed? Easing off, Captain. Good. Fuel consumption right on target. Storm's moving starboard. We should miss the worst of it. Need a break? No. Yeah, but I, I could use some coffee. Ah, right on cue. 
Yes? I made some fresh coffee. <laughs> you read my mind, Joni. Mm, one cream and sugar, one black. Put it next to the console, will you? Mm. Hit a little bump back there, huh? Sorry. Tried to go over it, but it should be smoother from here on. Oh, I'm not worried. We're in good hands. Everybody sleep through it? Almost everybody. One crying kid and one slightly uptight passenger. Ah, the old lady. Huh? Oh, no. Mr. Wilson, 13A. What? Huh? What did he do? Didn't want to come out of the bathroom. Said he saw something. Where? Outside the plane when the lightning flashed. <laughs> the old wings moving routine. <laughs> Tell him it's supposed to move. If it doesn't, it'll snap off. Oh, you're going to love this. He said he saw a man on it. Don't tell me. Uh, an alien? You know, big head, round eyes, that thing? <laughs> <laughs> tell him you'll take a description for the captain's log. Oh, uh, listen, was he wearing a space suit? Oh, or was the clown shoe? Mm, it says he came down out of the sky and took a walk on the wing, just like that. Ah, yeah, a floater. Yeah, I see him once in a while, when I have too much to drink. Yeah. Or maybe a gremlin. A what? Haven't you heard of gremlins? Mm, must be before my time. Yeah, it started back in World War II. Whenever something went wrong, the mechanics would chalk it up to gremlins. Better than admitting they made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Wilson's okay now, but you should have seen his eyes. He looks scared out of his mind. For a minute there, I thought we had a nutcase on our hands. Well, cut off his drinks. Well, that's just it. He hasn't had a drop. Where's in-flight security? Uh, 32B. Well, tell him to keep an eye open. I'd like to run a tight ship. Yes, sir. But I don't think it'll be necessary. The wife gave him a sleeping pill. Thank heaven for pharmaceuticals. You fellas want some chow? We've got filet mignon in first class. No, thanks. You and Nancy relax for a while. Aye, aye, Captain. Listen, I can take over if you want to stretch your legs. You sure? Yeah, storm's standing out, just some more rain clouds. Well, maybe for a minute. Hey! That? Probably our friendly neighborhood gremlin dropping in for a wing walk. Mm. Bob? Hmm? Well, there you are. Go to sleep, darling. Right. I want to sleep, but I can't. She doesn't believe me. None of them believe me. I'm not even sure I believe it myself. Why should I? It's impossible. Yet I'm not dreaming. I'm wide awake and I'm cured. The doctor said so. No more panic attacks. But I saw it, didn't I? I was out there on the wing walking toward the engine. But why? There it is now. I can hear it. What's it doing? It wants to destroy this plane. Bring us all down. Be of me because I've seen it before or maybe it is all in my mind how can I be sure there's only one way God help me I've got to look I've got to time to be brave face it down and if there's nothing out there then that's that this is the only way here goes it's simple I put my hand out I pull the curtain aside and I'll know. He'll either be there on the other side of the window looking in or Bill be nothing but the darkness. One way or the other, I'll know. And put my hand out. Do it. Do it. It isn't. It can't be. Huh? Honey, wake up. Hmm? Come on. Come on, someone's got to see this. It's right there on the other side of the window. Yes? Come here, quickly. What is it, Mr. Wilson? Look. Where? Outside the window. Is it still there? Shh. I, I don't see anything. But... Hey, what, you mean the engines? They always spark at night. It means they're working. No, n not, not that. You, you, you don't see anything else? No, just the running lights blinking on and off. All right, look again. See if she's telling the truth or if she's blind. 
you're, you're right. I, I don't see anything now. Oh, it was probably the rain hitting the wind. Yes. Believe me, we fly worse weather than this. It's nothing to worry about. If you'll just try to relax, we'll be landing in a couple of hours. There it is again. Like some kind of ape dropping down from a tree. What's he doing? No! He's peeling back the engine cover. What are you looking at? Ruth! Ruth! Thank God. Lean across me. Look out the window. Oh. Does the storm bother? No. Just like that, it's gone. For some reason, it doesn't want anyone else to see. Only me. It's playing a game, taunting me, daring me to stop it. Then what? Remember what I said before about seeing something outside? I, I know what you're going to say, but listen to me very carefully. <laughs> Honey, there's a, a man out there. Bob! Keep your voice down. Have you ever known me to lie to you? No. It, it's, it's not a human being. It's some kind oh, of... Bob. I'm not imagining it this time. I'm not. He's out there. Where? What? No, no, don't, don't look. He, he isn't there now. He, he jumps away before anyone can see him except me. I don't know what to say to you. I, I realize what this sounds like, but give me the benefit of the doubt. Do I look insane to you? I didn't say that, but Bob... I know I had a breakdown, and I know how it looks to you now, as if the same thing's happening again, but it, it isn't. Bob... I, I didn't want to upset you. No. I want you to tell me. I didn't tell you before because I I wasn't sure if it was real. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure now there is a man out there or a, a creature of, of some kind. <laughs> if, if I describe him to you, oh, you'd really think I was gone. Honey, no. No, it's all right. It's all right, sweetie. Don't stroke my hand like a child. I know your intentions are good. I, I know you love me, but don't patronize me, Ruth. I'm, I'm not insane. Did I say Does it that? have to be said? For the last time, that, that creature's out there. And the reason I'm telling you now is that he's starting to tamper with one of the engines. It's not just my life at stake. It's everyone on this plane. Shh. Think anything you want. Think that I belong in a straitjacket if it makes you feel any better. If it makes me feel better? I'm sorry. What, what I mean is whatever you think about me that I've lost my mind, all I'm asking you to do is tell someone. Talk to the pilot now. He's back there with the stewardess. Tell him to check the wing. If they don't see anything, fine. I'll commit myself. But if they do, there's still time. They can make a forced landing before something terrible happens. Won't you even allow the possibility? That... All right. I'll tell you. I know it seems a lot to ask. It's as if you're announcing that you're married to a lunatic, but... I said I'll tell them. If that's what you want, stay here. She doesn't believe me. But that doesn't matter. If she can get them to see it, then I'm not too late. There he is! Hurry! Hurry, Ruth! Hurry! Look! Look! What's wrong with that man? I don't know. Tell him to sit down. We're trying to sleep over here. Quickly! What's going on? He's pulled up one of the cowling plates. He? Yeah, didn't my wife... Take your seat, please. There's a man outside. He just... Mr. Wilson, keep your voice down. I, I'm sorry, I but... don't know what's going on here. Will you look? Mr. Wilson, I'm warning you. All right. I'm sitting. But will you look out the window? See for yourself. Take my wife's seat. What am I looking for? The plate. The hood over the engine with all the wiring underneath. He's bedded up so it's exposed. If you don't do something, there's going to be a short circuit. Maybe a, an electrical fire. Well, there's nothing exposed now. What? Wait, wait a minute. I... I... I saw him pull that plate up. There were sparks and lights and... Then he must have bent it back the way it was. Listen, I saw it. I saw it! Mr. Wilson, please. I believe you. But there are other people on board and we mustn't alarm them. Y you mean you've seen him? Of course we have. But we don't want to frighten the passengers. You can understand that. 
Naturally, I, I only want to... We thought we'd taken care of the problem, but if he's back, well, we'll do a thorough check as soon as we're on the ground. But if we wait that long... You see the man on the aisle? He's a special investigator from the FAA. We have one on every flight now, and he's armed. If anyone tries to do something to the plane, he can handle it. Oh. That's his job. He knows what he's doing. I understand. I've asked him to change seats with your wife. If you see anything else suspicious, tell him. Then, when we land... You can stop the act now. Bob, they want me to sit up there for a while. Honey, this way, Mrs. Wilson. Everything okay, Captain? Yes, fine. If you'll just stay with Mr. Wilson till we land... Got it. I don't need his help. No problem. Just, uh, let me squeeze in here. Stop humoring me. Mr. Wilson, I assure you, it's under control. Nothing to worry about now. If that's the way you want it, I won't say another word. I'll see us crash first. He's at it again. Filling back the plate, putting his horrible, misshapen fingers into the wires. Did you feel that? Feel what? Nothing. No, go ahead. I'll put it in my report. I just thought we changed altitude for a moment. Pilot must have made an adjustment. Let to stay above the storm. Yes, that must be it. I wonder if I can get some information from you. About what? May I see your ID? You have your wallet, don't you? Of course I do. Why wouldn't I? Here, here. Robert Jeffrey Wilson. Ever been arrested? Never. Why, why do you ask? Oh, just for the record. I'm a law-abiding citizen. I'm sure you are. What kind of gun do you carry? Pardon? The pilot said you were armed. Oh, uh, standard issue 38. Never had to use it, though. Strictly a last resort. I thought guns weren't allowed on board. Well, they're not for the passengers. But with security so tight now, well, we don't like to advertise it. Then you should keep your coat buttoned. I can see the holster. Bob, how are you feeling? Great. How about you? I brought you some water and another pill, so you can sleep the rest of the way. That sounds... fine. Go ahead, Mr. Wilson. Take it. Why not? I hope you're doing okay now, honey. Couldn't be better. I'll be just a few rows up if you need me. I don't need anything, Ruth. Get some rest. You too. I love you, you know. Same here. It won't be long now. For what? Until we sit down. You're lucky. Am I? You get to sleep through it. Let them think that. I didn't swallow the pill. How could I? What's going on out there? Somebody has to do something and we're all doomed. minute and he'll have the entire engine exposed. All I can see is the glow of the engine and that creature. I have to act now. Hey, what are you doing? Somebody's got to stop that thing. That's the emergency exit. Take your hand off. Leave me alone. You'll depressurize the whole cabin. Got to stop oh this man. Don't push the door open. Don't. Oh I'm placing you under arrest. You! Out there! Get away from the engine! I can't hold it! You! Demon! I told you to get off the wing! Somebody grab his leg while I get the door closed! I'm trying! Give me your gun! Let go of it! You can't! You bet I can! Get away from this plane or I'll shoot! <laughs> Easy. Lift the gurney down. Yeah, I got it. Here come the paramedics. Oh, good. What do we have here? A guy tried to open the safety hatch. Keep him strapped down. He's out of his tree. We'll take it from here. Turn him over to the feds. He's got a string of charges.
Bob, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. I know. But right now, I'm the only one who does. Okay, you grease monkeys, give this plane the once-over. Yes, sir. Now, what about the emergency door? Get up on the wing and replace the seal. Then do a pressure test. You got it. Nuttiest way I ever heard of trying to commit suicide. Yeah, it takes all kinds. Well, when you look at that... What happened? I don't know. But something sure did a job on engine number two. Whole cover plate's bent back. What do you think could have bent it back like that? Beats me. Yeah, let's go to work. The flight of Mr. Robert Wilson is over now. A flight not only from point A to point B, but from the fear of madness to sanity. Mr. Wilson has that fear no longer, though for the moment he may be quite alone in his conviction. Happily, that conviction will not remain private much longer. For this time, tangible evidence has been left behind, even from so intangible a region as the Twilight Zone. Please like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. The Twilight Zone continues in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, You'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Grandpa, shall I keep your dinner warm for you? Grandpa? Yes, Marnie. Just let me lie down for a moment and rest my eyes. <sighs> now, why is that clock slowing down? I guess I better check it. Uh, let's have a closer look, old friend. What time is it now? Well, uh, 7.31 exactly by my pocket watch. But you say 725. Oh, no, 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 no. That'll never do. And to think that I gave you an overhaul just last week. Now, where did I put my tools? First things first. Reset the hands. Uh-huh. And there. And a drop of oil here. And one here. Oh, I'll have you ship shape again. You'll see. My grandfather's clock was too large for the shelf, so it stood ninety years on the floor. 
It was taller by half than the old man himself, though it weighed not a penny weight more. Oh, no. What's wrong? There he goes again. You noticed. I guess we should be thankful he has a hobby at his age. The clock or the song? Oh, Doug. Should I be worried? Honey, we've had this conversation before, remember? First it's the song. And always the same one. Then he forgets to come down for breakfast. Or lunch or dinner. Do you realize he hasn't been out of his room all day? I know. That clock is all he ever thinks about. It's more than a hobby. It's his whole life now. Sweetheart, I know how much you love him. And I love you. But maybe it's time to face facts. I kept his plate warm. I'll take it upstairs. Just give it some thought. That's all I'm saying. I will. Only I'm afraid... I... have no idea how to bring up the subject with him. No idea at all. It is said that each man carefully measures his time. Some with fear, some with hope and some with joy. But Mr. Sam Forstman's time is measured by a grandfather's clock, and from all accounts it is unique, because this particular clock keeps a special kind of time, marked only in the Twilight Zone. Now, back to the Twilight Zone and our story, 90 Years Without Slumbering, starring Bill Irwin with Stacy Keach as your narrator. It was bought on the morn of the day that he was born and was always his treasure and pride. But it stopped short, never to go again when the old man died. Ninety years without slumbering. Tick tock, tick tock, his life. Seconds numbering. Tick tock, tick tock. Grandpa. Oh, come in, Marnie. What are you doing? Oh, it's been a few minutes off lately. Quite a mystery. Uh, but, but don't you worry. We're I, I, I'll solve it. At least move the lamp, Grandpa. You're going to ruin your eyes. I can see quite well, thank you. Uh, besides, I know practically every part by heart. But why does it matter that much to you? I wouldn't expect you to understand. Once a clockmaker. I brought you dinner. Dinner? You're awfully early tonight. Besides, I don't need room service. I, I would have come down. It's almost eight o'clock. It is? Oh, what happened to the time? I'll leave your plate on the dresser. You do that. Thank you, Marnie. You're too good to me, you know that? Grandpa? Are you feeling all right? Me? Never better. Why? It's just that you spend so much time up here. And for that, I apologize. It's the clock. There must be some dust in the mainspring. In fact, you haven't been out of your room since yesterday. It's my friend's fault. Your friend? Been acting up, but, but once I get him adjusted properly... Actually... We wanted to talk to you about that. We? Doug and I. Grandpa, we know you love the clock, but... But he's ticking along nicely now. There, there. Shouldn't have any trouble for a while. Of course, a clock as old as that. Well, uh, you're bound to have problems of one sort or another on occasion. Just like people, huh, Marnie? <laughs> of course, Grandpa. Why don't you get some rest? Oh, you know me, dear. Never sleep. But I, I, I might lie down for a few minutes uh, to rest my eyes. You do that. Good night, Grandpa. Good night, sweetheart. Well? Well what? Did you talk to him about it? I tried, but I couldn't, Doug. I just couldn't. He's such a wonderful man. I know. If only he weren't... Senile? Well, it's the truth. Somebody had to say it. Oh, Doug. 
What are we going to do? Ooh, uh, oh, oh, oh. Now what's wrong with you? Where's my pocket watch? I, I gotta turn on the lamp. Uh, oh, 941. And uh, you, Grandfather Clock, what do you say? 935? But I just reset you. Oh, oh running slow again. Wait, I, I, I didn't wind it properly. That's it. Uh, they're making me so nervous I've grown careless. I must let that happen. Yeah, here, let me give you a good winding. Oh, no, 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 but please, but please don't stop. Oh, I, 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 I'll never forget to wind you again, I, I promise. Uh, uh, oh, well, there, that's better. Remember, you and I are the only ones who know what'll happen if you run down. But we won't tell anybody, will we? Oh, no, 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 of course we won't. Want some hash browns with your eggs, honey? No, thanks. Are you sure? Just the bacon is fine. I wonder if I should make some for Grandpa. Where is he this morning? Still sleeping, I guess. I'm not surprised. He must have fiddled with that darn clock till four in the morning. I know. Did you hear him? I heard him. Is that all you're having? Coffee? I'm not very hungry. What about the baby? You're eating for two now. That's one thing you don't have to worry about, Doug. Marnie? What? Let's not fight about this. I'm not. Honey, I only mean that you've got to accept the facts. Your grandfather's not a well man. Oh, Doug. I don't know what to do. Take it easy. He's always been so alert, so easy to be with. He's the same grandfather you've always had. But everybody faces this. Your loved ones grow old, and there are decisions to be made. You try your best to do the right thing. Why don't you come right out and say it? You want to have him put away. I don't know about that. But why don't we at least let Mel look him over? Can we do that? Just to be sure. You think I'm crazy. Grandpa. Marnie. Doug. How long have you been standing there? Long enough. Look, Sam, don't take this the wrong way. Mel Avery's a psychiatrist, a head shrinker. You don't have to tell me, or no. Grandpa, listen to me. Mel's been a friend of ours for years. He and Doug went to college together. You've met him. Well, I've met a lot of people, but I don't let them tinker with my head. Sam, nobody's going to do that. All we're suggesting is that you see Mel and talk to him. It's not a big deal. Why should I see a psychiatrist? You think I need one? Well, I wouldn't put it that way. Will you please sit down? Have some breakfast with us. Here, right next to me. Well, if you're sure there's room. Coffee? No, 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 no. I'm wide awake. See? I even dressed myself and managed to come downstairs without a nurse or a walker. That good enough for you? Nobody's criticizing you. It's just that things happen to people's minds, especially as we get older. You think there's something the matter with my mind? She didn't say that. Well, she might as well have. I'm talking about physical things. That's why we all have a checkup once in a while. What's wrong with me physically? I, I can see you all right, and I, I move around on my own. You sure can. And I can use my hands, the same as always. I know. For example, you... You love to work on that clock. But you've gotten so preoccupied with it that it takes up all your time. So I'm fond of my clock, and that makes me crazy. My, what a strange world we live in. Sam? You'll have to admit you spend a great deal of time with it. Sometimes three or four hours a day. Sometimes half the night. Aha! Just because I don't sleep my life away and working on that clock relaxes me, that makes me a candidate for the loony bin? Well, for your information, I've had insomnia all my life. And so did my father. He lived until he was 90. Just like the song says, 90 years without slumbering. Oh, yes. The song. It was written before you were born, my boy. I think you're misunderstanding. 
Doug only has your best interests at heart. <laughs> My best interests? You think I'm afraid? All right, that does it. I'll see your friend, the psychiatrist, and we'll find out just who's crazy in this household and who isn't. Go ahead, call him. How about this afternoon? Send him in. Yes, doctor. So you're him. Mel Avery. How do you do, Mr. Forstman? Pretty well, young man, if the truth be told. Well, come in. Make yourself comfortable. If you insist. Am I supposed to lie down on the couch? Well, whatever you like. I thought we could just talk for a few minutes, you know, get acquainted. Oh, don't worry about the bedside manner. I, I know what I'm here for. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Forstman. Oh, Sam, please. Mr. Forstman was my father, rest his soul. Doug's told me so much about you. Oh? Such as? That I've got a screw loose somewhere, is that it? <laughs> Not at all. Can I offer you anything? A glass of water? Let's get right to it, shall we? If you like. Uh, I jotted down a couple of things. Uh, let's see here. I understand you were a clockmaker. That must have been interesting work. I am a clockmaker. Oh, I'm retired now, but it's in the blood. My life's work. You understand. <laughs> Indeed I do. Doug says you have a particular clock you're fond of. A real antique. Must be worth a great deal. Oh, I'd never sell it. It, it was presented to me on the day of my birth. My father loved my mother very much, you see. And in those days, it was fashionable for a husband and wife to love each other for their entire lives. And it's no longer fashionable? Well, if it were, the woods wouldn't be so full of marriage counselors these days. So the clock was a kind of symbol. You were born on the same day, so to speak. You want me to tell you I think the clock is alive, don't you? Like a real person. Well, I don't think that. It's a mechanism, nothing more, nothing less. Then why are you so concerned with keeping it in perfect condition? That clock is not only priceless, Doctor. It's a family heirloom. Wouldn't you want to maintain it as perfectly as possible? Well, yes, but... You aren't sure? Yes, I'm sure. But then we aren't talking about my clock. We're talking about your clock, aren't we? Oh, you have a grandfather's clock, Doctor? As a matter of fact, my wife bought one recently. She collects antiques. Tell me about it. Whatever comes to mind. Well, it's about eight feet tall, hand-carved, built in Germany in 1874. But we're talking about you, Mr. Forstman. Uh, Sam. Oh, why, I thought we were talking about your clock. Oh, well, we were, but we've gotten off the track. Track? Are we going to talk about trains now? No. Well, if you've nothing more you want to discuss... I could talk about clocks for hours, Doctor, but your time is expensive. Mine's free. I think I'd better go now, for your sake. It's been a pleasure. Uh, there is one little thing. Yes? I know that when my clock stops ticking, so will I. Really? You believe you'll die on that day? Does that make me crazy? No. But it is rather unusual. How's your clock running, by the way? Why, well, I don't know. You might want to have it checked. If I had a clock like that... You'd what? I... I'd get rid of it. I'd have to. So, either I go or the clock goes. Is that what you're telling me? I didn't say that. Well, I, I didn't think you did. I mean, why would anybody say a thing like that? Why, well, I don't know. Such an idea would have no rational basis. It certainly wouldn't. Definitely. None at all. Indubitably. Then that should put your mind at ease. I hope I've been of service, Doctor. Have a nice day. Hey, Doug. Marnie. I can't thank you enough for seeing him. Yeah, thanks, Mel. It's not a problem. I enjoyed it. He's very entertaining. Oh, he's a character, all right. So, what's the verdict? He seems to be in marvelous shape for a man his age. I'm sure of that. He just had a complete checkup. What about up here? Yes, his mind. That's what we're concerned about. Oh, he's alert, aware, no signs of any cognitive disorder. 
Did he talk about the clock? He sure did. And? Oh, I wouldn't worry too much about it. At his age, a man's entitled to a few quirks. You mean he doesn't need to be put into an institution? Well, not as long as he has no debilitating physical problems. He should be able to continue living a productive life. But I do want to say something about this attachment of his. The clock business? I don't want to minimize it, but if I were you, I'd try to involve him in other things. I'm sure he has various interests. Oh, yes, he reads a lot. And he's good around other people. I can believe that. He's a great conversationalist. The problem is, so many of his friends have passed away. Hmm. Does he ever go to the senior center? Anything like that? I took him by there once, but he wasn't interested. You can understand that. They're strangers to him. They have their own lives and families. You might see if there's a regular group at the library. A good way to meet people with something in common. If we can ever get him away from that darn clock. It's worth it to make the effort. There is a risk in being so deeply attached to an object. Any object. What kind of risk? The clock is becoming an obsession. He's equating it with his own lifespan. That's not good for a man Sam's age. Whatever you do, do it gracefully. Change is a big thing at this point in life. But I hope you can find something else to engage his attention. Instead of letting him focus so completely on the clock, his world is closing in. Take my advice. Do everything you can to help him expand it. And soon. Grandpa? Are you awake? Come on in. I thought you might be taking a nap. Oh, no, no, no. I was just uh, resting my eyes. I see the clock's running perfectly again. Perfectly. Uh, uh, Marnie, I, uh, I wanted to talk to you about that. Oh, it's all right. Listen, Grandpa. Doug and I have to run into town. We were wondering, would you like to come with us? Afraid not, dear. I thought we could stop off somewhere, get some lunch. Anywhere you like. Some other time. I have too much to do. Like what? That's what I wanted to ask you. Would, would you mind if I move it? Move? The clock. After all, it takes up so much space here in my room. Yes, it does. So you have no objection? Just as long as you don't try to do it yourself. Oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> there were those fellows who came out one time. Uh, uh, what were their names? Uh, uh, when you put the, the those other things of mine into storage. I know who you mean. Something like the Starving Artists Moving Company? Wasn't that it? Exactly. No jobs too weird for us. <laughs> that, that was their motto. <laughs> Well, if, if they don't charge too much, maybe they'd lend us a hand. I'm sure they would. Grandpa, I think that's a great idea. It's settled then. I'll arrange it. You two kids have fun. Watch your step. Yeah, the carpet, I see it. Set her down for a minute. <sighs> Couldn't he just use a watch? Or a sundial. Never have to move one of those. Set it and forget it. <laughs> How does that song go? My grandfather's clock was too large for the shelf. Something, something. Else. So it stood 90 years on the floor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, you must be very careful. Okay, let's up to. We got two more calls to make. All right, one, two, three. Watch it. I, I got it. Careful, I said. The, 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 the pendulum. Uh, oh, if it stops. Not so fast. Okay, straighten it. Straighten her up. I can't. Watch it. Oh. Watch it. Please. Keep lifting. I'm losing my grip. Whoa. Oh. Uh, sorry, Pops. That last step's a doozy. No damage done, huh? I'll start her running again. Yeah, you do that. He said he don't want it to stop, remember? No problem. <laughs> I'll just open up the case and give it a push. That ought to get it, huh, Pops? Pops? What's the matter with him? I don't know. He just keeled over. Hey, Sal, feel for his pulse. Oh, I can't find it. Call 911. The old guy looks like he's dead. Okay, uh, I'm calling an ambulance. Right. Where's the phone? Hey, Pops, come on. You didn't croak on us, did you? 
quit fooling now. Oh, phone's in the kitchen. I can see it. Uh, I gotta move the clock to get by. Hey, wait, he's breathing. Uh, 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 uh. Yes! Hey, you gave us a scare there. Uh, what happened? Uh, my, my clock. Easy now. Oh, uh, I'm all right. Don't try to get up. Yeah, just stay where you are. Don't be silly. Still want a doctor? A doctor? I never wanted one in the first place. Okay, okay, no doctor. Just let me give you a hand. Listen. What? My clock. It's still ticking. Yeah, sure. You had us worried there for a minute, you know? Don't do that, Pops. <laughs> I guess it, it, it just wasn't my time. Not yet. Not quite yet. Here we are. Almost home. You think he'll like it? Like what? The takeout we brought him. It used to be his favorite. Sure he will, honey. You think he's serious about the clock? That was what he said. He definitely wanted to move it. Well, wonders never cease. I'll carry the food. I want him to have it before it gets cold. Go ahead, I'll catch up. I hope you treat me this nice when I get old. Marnie? Oh, no. What's the matter? Oh, Doug, look. Whoa. I didn't know he was going to move it today. Next to the bookcase? It's so huge. Maybe he's trying to make a statement. He's trying to make a compromise with us. Oh, you're back early, children. Hello, Grandpa. I thought we'd give it a try down here and just see how it looks. What do you think? Well, I don't know. You can see for yourself, can't you, Sam? Yeah, yes, yes, I, I see. It sticks out like a sore thumb. Uh-huh. Are you sure? I think Doug's right. Well, when you put it that way... You seem a little shaky. Are you all right? Yes, of course. You didn't do any of the lifting yourself, did you? Oh, no, no, no. Some, some nice college boys. That's what artists look like nowadays, I suppose. You're awfully pale. Oh, stop fussing. I'm fine. You might as well be honest about all this. We talked to the doctor. You did? Well, what a coincidence. So did I. Well, he said... He said you're becoming obsessed with it. And that's not good for you. Senile. That's what he really said, isn't it? No, Grandpa, he didn't. Well, I'm not going to any loony bin. That's final. Nobody said anything about... But I'll tell you what I will do. I'll sell it. You heard me. Before that happens, I'll sell the clock once and for all and be done with it. See, a red queen on the black king. The room's going to be a beautiful nursery, Marnie. You like the fabric samples? Perfect. Now all you have to do is find the right paint, and you're set. And a black nine, red eight. Is that what you did? You won't believe this, but I actually refused to get pregnant till I had the baby's room all planned out. George said that wasn't logical. <laughs> I'd have to agree with him, Carol. There's still some coffee left. Maybe just one cup. Sit down. And where will you be moving after the baby comes, Mr. Forstman? Oh, uh, what did you say, young lady? My grandfather's staying right here, Carol. Oh, of course. I didn't mean... I'll need his help around the house. I wouldn't know what to do without him. I'm sure you wouldn't. Are you going to keep the clock downstairs? We haven't decided. Uh, Carol. Yes, Mr. Forstman? Uh, Carol, do you know anyone who might like to buy it? Sure. Me. Wish I could afford it. Do you mean that? Do I? You know how I feel about antiques. Something like this would make my front hall. Well, I think we could work out something. Uh, you could even pay me later. It doesn't matter. Are you serious, Mr. Forstman? It would be ideal uh, with you living next door. I could visit the clock every day. Not every day, surely. I, I mean, I could look after it and keep it in good condition, you know. Oh, I'd appreciate that. You see, this is a very special clock. Not one of your normal eight-day models. It has to be wound every other day. 
Carol wouldn't want you tinkering with it all the time. It'd just take me a few minutes, three times a week. I wouldn't mind, Marnie. Your grandfather would take such good care of it. If you're sure. It's up to you two. Oh, I can't wait to see how it looks. And George says I don't have an eye for bargains. Wait till he hears about this. Good morning, my dear. Grandpa, up so early? Early to bed, early to rise. Ben Franklin said that, I believe. Or was it George Washington? Well, no matter. Uh, time to wind the clock. Oh, that's why you have your toolkit. Every other morning for two weeks now. Don't you remember? Well, you could have slept in today. George and Carol are out of town. They are. Just for the weekend. The, the weekend, but, but, but it runs down after 48 hours. Grandpa, are we going to start that again? We've been so happy lately. Yes, we've been happy. Two weeks of borrowed time. I should be grateful. And that's the evening news. Repeating our top local story, suburban crime dropped 17% since the mayor's new neighborhood watch program. We'll be back Sam, news you in there? Well, where else would I be? Missed you at dinner tonight. Oh, uh, I'm a little under the weather. I decided to save my strength. Anything I can get you? No, no, no. I'm just going to watch TV for a while. Sam, I just wanted to say that it's great to be a family again. Eating our meals together... We missed you tonight. Just didn't feel the same. Thank you, Doug. And the same to Marnie. And now I think I'll lie down and rest my eyes before the movie starts. You do that, Sam. See you in the morning. And say good night to Marnie for me. Will do. Good night. Uh, oh, what? Oh. Oh. I, I must have dozed off. Where's my pocket watch? Why, it's nearly 2 a.m. in the morning. Oh, better be careful not to wake them. I'll uh, just get my tools. Oh, thank goodness for street lamps. Uh, let's see now. Uh, there's Carol and George's, uh, and the front walk, and the porch. I'll be able to see through the pane in the door, I hope. Oh, good, good. They, they left the hall light on. Yeah, there it is. Uh, how's the time? 2.31. Oh, he's lost 20 minutes already. I've got to get in. Oh. Pull over. I saw something. Where? In front of that house. Shine the light on it. I don't see. Wait a minute. Hey, you! Uh, me? Hold it right there. Don't move. You're not speaking to me, are you, officer? You live here? Well, yes. I, well, but, but, I, I mean, no. Well, well, not exactly. Let's see some ID. Certainly. No, I, I'm afraid I left my wallet at home. So this isn't your house? No, but my clock's in here. Uh, they're away for the weekend, you see, and... Oh, uh, so you figured the place would be empty. No, I, I need to wind it. Where do you live, Gramps? Uh, next door. Uh, the clock. Uh, it, it, it's running down. And, and, and Carol left without telling me. And now it must be wound. It must. Say... What's he got in the bag? Oh, looks like lock picking tools. Oh, they're they're for fixing clocks. Uh, you you don't understand. It's a very important clock. Maybe we got to take him down to the station. Ah, he's harmless. Come on, Gramps. We'll get you home. Oh, please, 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 just let me wind it first. Quiet down. You'll wake up the whole neighborhood. But I've got to get inside. Now look, Mister. This is private property. You can't go in there. Don't you see? I'm running down, too. If it stops, I'll die. 
I doubt that, old fellow. But come along now. But please, 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 officer. We're very sorry this happened. Sure, I understand. He's not usually like this, honestly. Happened to my old man. We put him in a home. He likes it there. Good night, officers. We appreciate it. Good night, folks. Ma'am? Come on, Grandpa. Let's go upstairs. It's my fault, Barney. I shouldn't have expected anybody to believe me. Can I get you anything? No, 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 no. Uh, I won't need a thing anymore. Why do you say that? Don't worry, dear. It's, it's better this way. Better? Let me give you one last hug. Mm. Don't talk that way. We'll have breakfast in the morning. Uh, good night, darling. Good night. It is better this way. It has to come sometime. I want it to come for me here. For us to go. And just where are we going? Close your eyes, old friend, and lie back down. It's easier that way. In a pig's eye. What are you doing in my bedroom, anyway? The face is familiar. It should be. But I don't think we've been formally introduced. I am your spirit. Our time has come, Sam. After all, you are 76. That's nothing. And don't give me that spirit of 76 stuff. Who says my time has come? Have you forgotten what your father told you? Not to mention your grandfather. About what? Didn't they always tell you that if ever the clock runs down... You would die. Yeah. You know, I actually used to believe that stuff. But it's a lot of foolishness. I know. I, I've been to a psychiatrist. So what? So he didn't think I needed that clock. He didn't think I was crazy either. And you know what? He was right. All this time we were wrong. Sorry, Sam. I prefer to believe our grandfather. I never trusted head shrinkers myself. Now you listen to me. My father and grandfather were from another generation. I live in the present. Live, I said. Look at yourself. You're just a figment of my imagination. I can see right through you. You don't exist, but I do. And I'll tell you when it's time to go. Only don't hold your breath. I've got a great-grandson coming soon, and I plan to be around so that I can play with him and watch him grow and take him to school, maybe even college. I repeat, I don't believe in you. Therefore, you don't exist. Now I ask you, am I right or am I right? I can't argue with that logic, Sam. I have to admit you have a point. Let me know when it's time, Sam. Let me know. Oh, there. Now maybe a fella can get a little peace around here. Grandpa. Marnie, why are you still up? I was worried about you. Well, what you should be worrying about is my great-grandchild. Now, come on. If you can't sleep, I'll make you a cup of hot chocolate. That should do the trick. Why, Grandpa, where did you get all the energy? Never you mind. Now, now, take my arm here. Uh, careful now, now. Oh, uh, oh, oh, wait a minute. What's wrong? I have a confession to make. I'm afraid I cheated your friends. Cheated? That old clock hasn't been running right for 40 years. It's taken everything I know just to keep it going. Really, Grandpa? 
As a matter of fact, it stopped ticking for the last time just a few minutes ago. Now, how would you know that? Don't ask me how, my dear. I guess I know my grandfather's clock by now. But you know something, Marnie? When that clock finally died tonight, it was, it was like, well, like I was born all over again. Was it? I'm not kidding. Like a great weight was lifted off my shoulders. And now I, I feel like I can do just about anything. Well, for starters, we could get you into town a little bit. Clocks are made by men, but only God is responsible for time. No man can prolong his allotted hours, or cut them short for that matter. He can only live them to the fullest. That's our legacy in this world, as well as in the Twilight Zone. Please like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Ninety Years Without Slumbering, starring Bill Irwin with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling from a story by George Clayton Johnson. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Fernette Lebo, Doug James, Kurt Nabig, Rich Komenik, Sean Cross, Steve Key, and Jeff Lupiton. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. <laughs>